Last night in game one, LSU fell behind early, making some costly errors. But the Tigers starting pitcher, Anthony Renato, kept his team close. And Ryan Schimpf's big three-run home run gave the Tigers a lead they wouldn't give up. Tonight, LSU hopes to eliminate the Owls and move on to Omaha and the College World Series. Welcome to ESPN's coverage of the NCAA Baseball Super Regionals presented by Capital One. It's another gorgeous June day in the Deep South. LSU one win away from heading back to the College World Series. The Tigers can eliminate the Owls with a victory tonight here in Baton Rouge. The Arkansas Razorbacks won again today to become the first team to advance to the College World Series, which starts a week from today. The winner of this series between Rice and LSU will meet the Virginia Ole Miss winner, which is going to a third game tomorrow. Hi again, everybody. Welcome to the new Alec Box Stadium here in Baton Rouge alongside my partner, Kyle Peterson, former three-time All-American at Stanford. I'm Clay Matvick. And LSU has Rice right where they want him. The offense came alive yesterday, a big six-run fifth inning, and Ryan Schimpf provided the key blow. Guy that's led him in home runs all season, and Schimpf is a guy that in this offense sometimes gets overlooked. I mean, we talk about a lot of the other guys in this offense, but Schimpf has the numbers that really stand out. Last night comes up in a big spot, left on left. Three-run home run that gives LSU at that point a 5-4 lead, and the offense would just continue from there, and that had this place jumping from then on out. Yeah, record-setting crowd last night. Besides that inning, Rice wasn't bad last night, and the country got a glimpse of rookie uh, Anthony Rendon for Rice. You can see why he was Conference USA's Player of the Year. Well, in the national freshman year, this is a kid you're going to see play for a long time. He will play in the big leagues if he stays healthy. At that third base position, big time power. Hit a ball out of sight last night to left center field. You just don't see freshmen like Rendon very often. Three hits last night, scored a couple runs. He was a lot of the Rice offense. They'll need more than him tonight if they're going to even this thing up. LSU looking for the knockout goes with righty Lewis Coleman. Rice countering with Ryan Berry, hoping to force a game three. The NCAA Super Regionals is presented on ESPN by Capital One. What's in your wallet? And in part by GMC. We are professional grade. What a great tailgating spot. Baton Rouge. Probably uh, the best food in college baseball. You and I could speak to them. Let's take a look at our Coca-Cola starting lineup. First for LSU as uh, they are the visiting team in this game too. It's DJ LeMayhew leading off followed by Ryan Schimp. Let's see what he can do for an encore. Blake Dean in the three spot. Micah Gibbs, Mikey Matuk, Jared Mitchell, Sean Ochenko getting the start again. Derek Helenihi getting the start at third base tonight. And Austin Nola is the shortstop. They're going to be facing Ryan Berry. Is the sixth best ERA in the country right now. And he's had some injury issues this year, Kyle Peterson, but certainly a guy that they're happy to have on a mound in a big game like this. Yeah, and I think he's ready to go. I mean, Barry pitched last weekend and threw the ball fairly well. Gave up a fair amount of hits to K-State, but other than that, threw the ball well. But a guy that has a ton of experience. has pitched in Omaha the last two years. Obviously one of the top ERAs in the entire country. What to watch with Barry is early contact. He's real good when guys put the ball in place. Not going to strike a ton of guys out, but he will get a ton of ground balls. If he's getting early swings and early contact, Barry usually has success. So LeMayhew ready to dig in as LSU hits first. They've got their purple tops on tonight. Last night, they wore the gold jerseys. DJ LeMayhew out of Bloomfield Hills, Michigan which is near Detroit, fouls the first pitch off from Barry, strike one. Well, May he was made a pretty successful transition from shortstop to second base. We talked about it a little bit last night. Paul Maneri, the head coach for the Tigers, has pushed the right buttons again this year with moving some guys around. 
happened 40 games into the year, but since then, the Tigers have been on a hot streak. And I like the way LeMahieu looks at second base. I mean, he moves around okay, and remember, he's only been there for about 25 games now, so it's, he's still learning that position. Backs away from that one. Two balls and a strike. So man, Chris Guillaume getting him going already. Chris brought us some food up here. I'm going to give you some in a little bit, but I'm going to... I'm going to take some first. What did he uh, bring up I, here? I, I'm sure we got some frog legs and some gator. <laughs> two and two. They always treat us well down here. I, you know, I wasn't kidding about the best food in college baseball. I think it's right here. Yeah. You know, the last two years, you and I have been uh, lucky enough to do the Super Regionals here in Baton Rouge. And I think you and I have added about five pounds each That's, each year. Yeah, that might be low. Inside out swing the other way and down the line for LeMahieu. It's going to get in. He's going to try for extra bases. Gets away from Mazingo and right. He doesn't know it, and he slid into second. D.J. LeMahieu could have had three, but he thought he was going to have a hard enough time getting for getting two, and he slid into second. He'll hold up there. Ball hit to the right side. When you come out of the box, everything's in front of you, so it's really the decision of the hitter as to whether or not he wants to press this, and you see LeMahieu's going to stay on this ball the entire time. Down that line, really no chance for Mazingo to get to it in time, and then he bobbles it. But when the bobble happens, LeMahieu's already committed to second base and his head's down, so he's not going to see this. Most times, guys are going to look at the third base coach, but not here. I mean, he's busting to try again in the second, make sure that he scores, and I don't see any problem with this. You can't look again. He's already committed. Good effort to slide in. And you look at it from the top and say, why wasn't he at third base? I like that he just committed to second. And now Ryan Schimpfel here. Another thing, too, Kyle, is that Javi Sanchez, the third base coach for the Tigers, I'm sure he was as loud as he could possibly be, but this is a loud building yeah. when something goes right for the Tigers. Yeah, and it just continually gets louder. I mean, the more things that they do, this place gets jumping. A ball and a strike to Schimp, who last night went two for four. With that big three-run home run, he drove in four runs total in game one. Now he's a chance to drive in one early for LSU. Ryan Berry, 7 and 1 on the year. And Schimpf calls time, and he is granted time by the home plate umpire. Bill Speck moving from first base to behind the plate tonight. Very first team all conference USA despite missing a lot of time. Missed five weeks with a shoulder injury. This is off the plate. Two balls and a strike. As you see what Schimpf was able to do in game one and his season numbers. See the approach so far in this at bat to Schimpf, and I think that's going to stay pretty consistent. Away, away, and probably soft away. I want to give him everything to drive here. This one gets out of play. It's two and two. It's interesting. Last night we were talking about Mike Ojula and his injury situation. And it's the same thing for Ryan Berry. Part of the reason that Wayne Graham had one of the most difficult seasons as the head coach at Rice, his top two starters were out at the same time for the better part of a month. About half of their conference season. You talk about losing your Friday and Saturday guy for that long. 2-2 is high. It's now a full count to Shim. Rice did not win the regular season of Conference USA this year, and that has not happened for a long time. They did win the conference tournament in advance, but you know that's a big part of it. I mean, you lose your one and two guy in the middle of the season, and even though Wayne Graham always has a deep pitching staff, that's just something that very few teams can overcome. Walked him. Two on and nobody out for LSU here in the first. the 16th walk allowed this season by Ryan Berry. Here's the defense behind him. It's Michael Fuda in left field. Steven Sultzbaugh in center and Chad Mazingo out in right. Anthony Rendon, very good bat, but we've also seen already in this Super Regional excellent glove. Rick Haig, Brock Holt, and Jimmy Camerata from third to first. And Craig Manuel getting the start tonight behind the plate. Diego Seastrom, who was the starter behind the plate last night, is the DH today. Manuel, the freshman, has caught Barry for most of this year, and so Wayne Graham just trying to keep that consistent, puts the freshman behind the plate, see struck of DH. And Blake Dean now for LSU, one of the great power hitters in this program's history. 
already eighth on the team's all-time list with 42 career homers. And he has been a bane in Rice's side in the past. Down in the zone, two balls and no strikes. Last year, Dean had that walk-off three-run double to beat Rice at the College World Series and send the Owls home. Last night, two for three with a run batted in and three runs scored. And it's 3-0 as Ryan Berry continues to struggle here against the first three hitters in the LSU lineup. I think that the walk to Schimpf was kind of unintentional intentionally. You don't worry about putting a guy on first base. Nobody out can still run the double play. But they definitely didn't want to go 3-0 to Blake Dean right now. Berry has some of the best control in the entire country. But right here, you get a good hitter like Dean in a 3-0 count. I'd be surprised if he's not green-lighted. Swung on, hit well to right field, but right at Mazingo, who comes in to make the catch. That was a laser off the bat of Dean, but it's out number one. And Rice might have dodged a bullet right there, too, because Paul Benary rolls the dice, and I think rightly in this case, when Dean can do so many things with the bat, you give him a chance to swing at 3-0, and he got a pitch he could really handle. A fastball down the middle just happened to hit it right at the right fielder. Mazingo didn't hardly take two steps. A couple of them in right at him and that changes the entire inning and for Wayne Graham this might be the fastest he's ever had to come out and talk to Ryan Berry now the good news for Wayne Graham is they haven't allowed any runs and, and I think Berry's a guy that well, maybe most coaches would get a little bit more worked up in this situation but you know that more times than not he's going to work himself out of this jam I think in this spot it's just being a little bit over anxious to get in the setting there's over 9,000 people here and he's a kid that knows how important the situation is. He looks like he might just be a little bit too amped up. Rice used five pitchers last night, so if Wayne Graham can go a long way with Ryan Berry tonight, that's certainly to their benefit. One out for Micah Gibbs for LSU. Gibbs, the switch hitting catcher. Takes high, ball one. Gibbs hitting a 291 on the year. Last night, one for three with a walk. Everybody in the LSU lineup contributed some way offensively last night. That's how they can beat you. I mean, they are so deep. And Barry misses there. Two balls and no strikes. As you see, D.J. LeMayhew still at second base after the leadoff double. And Ryan Schimpf leading away from first. Two on, one out for LSU. Top of the first inning. LSU playing at home, but they're the visiting team in game two. There's a called strike on the outside black. If you're LSU, you've got to take advantage of this situation. You've got to get too many options to get a couple guys on early with nobody on that one out against a guy like Barry. And he's going to find that control. So when guys like this are struggling, you got to pile a couple on right at the beginning because you know it's inevitable that at some point he's going to find the zone. Breaking pitch. A little high. Three and one. Ryan Berry, starter, of course, but Graham has used him out of the pen, too, this year. He lost to Kansas State as a starter in the regional May 30th, but then came back to close out the win two days later against the Wildcats in the title game. Finds the zone there, and now it's a full count with Mikey Matuk on deck for LSU. Bases loaded for the Tigers. So Gibbs is on. And they're jammed for Montuk. You know, Ryan Berry is a throwback. Everything about him, as you can see, is uh, <laughs> reminiscent of maybe a decade or two ago. Even his delivery uh, is unpolished. Right now, he's struggling with these Tigers struggling finding the strike zone but 
He's still one pitch away from getting out of this, and I can guarantee you that's what Barry's thinking right now. What I like about the mechanics is it looks like he's playing catch in the backyard. I mean, it looks like he just went back, grabbed the ball, and throws. And for Barry, it's real easy to repeat. And that's the key on the mound. If you've got mechanics you can repeat most of the time, you're going to have some success. Misses to Mata. Mikey Montuk last night was one for three with a run batted in, and he also had a great catch in center field. Diving toward the alley. LSU, chance for a big inning here in the top of the first. Nobody's taking the bat off their shoulder as they're waiting for Ryan Barry to throw some strikes. With, and it, to me, it's interesting, too, because I, I would be surprised if the LSU offensive game plan today was not to jump on Barry Erla because you know he's going to throw a lot of strikes. But they've had to adjust that so far because of that right there. I mean, 23 pitches, just eight strikes so far. There's one. Two and one now. Montuk has had a great rookie year. He was a reserve at the beginning of the season, but since March 25th, he has been the starting center fielder. A couple of home run balls against Harvard here at Alec Box, and since then, he's been the starter. And now Barry comes back to even out the count at two. Now we'll see if he tries to expand the zone against the freshman. You get him in a 2-2 count, and it's natural for a freshman to be a little bit anxious in a spot like this. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a break of ball out of the zone to see if my tickle chase. Breaking ball. This could be the ball he was looking for. Now they're only going to get one as they throw out Montuk. Well, Mayhew scores, and it's a 1 0 lead for LSU. Well, they got away with run right here. That's a break of ball that caught way too much of the zone. In this case, you're trying to either throw it down and just out of the zone or even bounce it, thinking that Montuk might chase. Watch the sequence right here. A couple break of balls to start it off to the freshman. Now you're going to come back with fastballs. So two fastballs over to even account at 2 and 2. And then a curveball that stayed belt high. I mean, he got away with it and is lucky that Matuk didn't hit that ball in a gap. LSU 33 and 3 this year against right handed starting pitching. They're facing a right hander here in game two of this series against Rice, and they've already gotten to Barry for one. And there's Jared Mitchell taking strike one. Mitchell coming off a great regional. He was named to the all-tournament team last night, however, went 0 for 4, still drove in a run, managed to steal a base, and was also caught stealing once. One of the fastest guys in the country. And it's a ball and a strike to Mitchell. Two-sport athlete, also a wide receiver for the football team. But he has been concentrating more on baseball this year, and you can see he's had an excellent season. Took something off. And third base umpire Joe Burleson says no, he didn't go. You know, the thing that impresses me a lot about Mitchell, too, is he's got the highest on base percentage the, on this entire LSU team. So, from a professional standpoint, the speed is obviously there. He's shown you a little bit of power this year. Defensively, he's real good. But the plate discipline and the ability to get on, even if he doesn't get a hit, has been great. Now it's two and two as Barry is just pitch away from getting out of this inning. Well, if he wiggles out of this too and only gives up one run, I mean that is that's a win for Rice. The base is loaded with one out, but now in a 2-2 count with a pretty dangerous hitter up there. He's not out of it yet. Got it. Ryan Barry. A little ticklish there, but he works out of it. One run on one hit for LSU. We've played a half. Tigers on top. An easy start for Wayne Graham's Rice Owls. He's already had to make one trip to the mound, but got out of a tough spot. 18th season, Coach Graham, four time National Coach of the Year. Here's his Coca Cola starting lineup. Rice will lead off Brock Holt for the second straight game, followed by Rick Haig, Chad Mazingo, Anthony Rendon is the third baseman, batting cleanup. Diego Seastrunk goes from behind the plate to the designated hitter role tonight. Michael Fuda, Steve Sultzbach, Craig Manuel, and Jimmy Camerata. The right-hander, Lewis Coleman, is pitching for LSU. An excellent season, 12 and 2 on the year. The 2009 SEC Pitcher of the Year. Guy that coming into this year, LSU looked at as probably going to be their closer. Started the first game of the year. 
But after that they thought he would go back to the bullpen. The freshman Maniot has been so good allowed Lewis Coleman to be a starter and he has absolutely flourished in that role. 119 strikeouts and 106 innings. You see a guy that really throws his crossed his body. We'll talk about that more as the game goes on. But it's very difficult for right handed hitters. Real good fastball and a good slider that comes off of it. But difficult for guys to pick the ball up because he hides it real well. So Rice already down a run, needing to win here today to force a game three, which would be played tomorrow night here in Baton Rouge. It's Brock Holt to lead it off. Holt one for five, a couple of runs batted in in game one. And he takes strike one. Brock Holt had that two run home run in the ninth inning, which gave Rice a ray of hope. But as it happens, LSU was able to win a 12 9. Ball and a strike to Holt. And, you know, when we were talking with Wayne Graham this week, he said, you know, keep an eye on Holt. He's got a lot of power from that leadoff spot. Showed us that last night. And he's got a base hit. A leadoff knock for Holt. And LSU defensively looks this way. It's Schimpf. Mott took and Mitchell in the outfield. Very speedy outfield, I might add. Derek Helenihi is at third. The freshman Austin Nola, who's had an excellent season at short. DJ LeMayhew. And Sean Ochenko on the right side. And Micah Gibbs is the catcher. A defense was an issue last night for LSU. Yeah, specifically for the freshmen. All three freshmen in the starting lineup made one error last night. Red led to really three of. Rice's four early runs, but after that, he settled down a little bit. He made a change at third base. Helen he is in today. A little bit of a defensive change, I think, today for Paul Maneri. Coleman checking the runner Holt over at first base. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned it. All the errors came from freshmen, and in a setting like this, the super regional in front of you know almost 10,000 people here in Baton Rouge, it had to be a bit unnerving for the young guys. Even though they play in this ballpark a lot, this is a different feeling than it's been all year. This one's fouled off by Haig. Two strikes to count. I mean, you get the place that's packed. I mean, we set an attendance record last night. I know it's only a year old, but set an attendance record last night. But we expect them to settle down a little bit tonight. And, and really, a couple of them were, were purely mental mistakes. I mean, the mistake by Nola was more of a mental mistake because he made a throw he shouldn't have made. The mistake by Matuk and Center was a mental mistake, just kind of taking his eye off the ball. In on the hands. And Haig is able to fight it off. Haig's a guy who leads Rice in strikeouts, but also gets his share of knocks. That's why Wayne Graham keeps him in the two hole. Last night went one for five at the plate, but also struck out twice. So Wayne Graham taking the good with the bad with Rick Haig. The 0 2. Hit him. And Lewis Coleman now. Much like Ryan Berry for Rice having a tough first inning. Here are the errors last night for LSU and Paul Maneri said, hey guys, we need to just settle down. And after that third error, they really did. No, they absolutely did. But I mean, up until that point, like right, looked like Rice was really going to be in control of this game. This one really was one of those tough ones. Ochenko misses the ball at first base, but he missed it because he lost it in the sun. The freshman Mott took it looked like Kind of took his eye off that ball right at the end. That's a ball we ought to be using two hands anyway. But after that, when the bats really woke up for LSU, they played pretty good defense the rest of the way. Good bunt for Mazingo. Coleman goes to first base for the out, but he does his job getting Holton Haig in scoring position. All right, an NCAA championship update in the studio to Ryan Burke. Thanks so much. Joined by Will Kimmy, Cal State Fullerton. Crush Louisville in game one and are on their way in game two. Titans playing good baseball. Jared Clark, the two run double. Two run double there. Also, three stolen bases, a hit by pitch, and a sack bunt, just suffocating the Cardinals offensively. And it's four zip. Cal State has only three hits, but the four runs after the quick lead. Well, an impressive start today for Fullerton, too, and they're doing it against Justin Marks, the ace of that Louisville staff. Thought he was going to throw yesterday. They held him back because he had pitched a little bit on Monday, but. Fullerton today doing it against a guy that was the best arm in the, in the uh, Big East this year. Now Anthony Rendon for Rice with one out here in the bottom of the first. Yeah, two on. 
So facing Lewis Coleman, the right-hander for LSU. Rendon has a 23-game hitting streak going. He was three for four with two runs batted in last night. He was on base four times. Hit his 20th home run of the year. And the guy is just a rookie. Out strike on the outside corner. He's ahead of Rendon 0-2. That kind of surprised him right here. A couple fastballs to start. I would bet that Rendon doesn't see too many one, two, or two pitch fastballs to start at bats. It was a good spot. It was a fastball on the outside part of the plate, but I think usually if somebody gets ahead of him, they're going to throw him a slider. And that one, I think, kind of took him by surprise. Rendon goes down looking, and even after that, he's still got a smile on his face. Yes, he does. I mean, he <laughs> seems to smile about everything. This ball's outside. I mean, it, Gibbs has to go get it, and that ball's off the plate now. It's a good spot. It's exactly where you want to throw it in an 0-2 cow, but the ball's outside. But three straight fastballs to Rendon, and I mean, you could tell. I think he was a little bit taken back that they went after him. Now Coleman to Diego Seastrunk. And Lewis Coleman is digging deep here in the first inning. Seastrunk, the uh, switch hitter. Batting from the left side against the right-hander, Coleman. Tries to spray this down the line, but it's fine. All in two. Seastrunk is definitely one of the ringleaders of this Rice bunch. Very likable. Move behind the plate from third base when Anthony Rendon took over that position. Trying to drive in a pair with a base hit here. Crowd comes to its feet. Coleman sails it high. One and two. Seastrunk's numbers down a little bit, but certainly a, the position change has been a part of the reason why. It's a much more taxing position behind the plate than at third. Coleman gets the ground ball. This should do it. And Rice strands a pair as Lewis Coleman a little fist pump, as Ryan Berry did for Rice. Coleman digs deep and gets out of a jam in the first. The road to Omaha continues on ESPN tomorrow with regional coverage from the NCAA Baseball Super Regionals. You're going to see North Carolina take on East Carolina. Game one of that series going to the Tar Heels. Baseball Super Regional coverage presented on ESPN by Capital One. That's Sunday at noon Eastern. Check your local listings. And follow us on the road to Omaha on Facebook and Twitter. Search ESPN College World Series on Facebook. All the great stuff there. And our own KP is on Twitter. He is tweeting on all the great stuff that's going on in the regionals. And you're going to continue that when you get back to huh? the Big O. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll do it all the way through the College World Series. Firing stuff away throughout the day, throughout the game today, too. Are you a computer whiz? No, not one bit. I think I've proven that so far this weekend. Every I wasn't member I think of the uh, <laughs> LSU ID, IT department has been over here to help me so far. <laughs> Shano Chinko to lead off here for the Tigers who have a one run lead. We'll see what Ryan Berry does here in inning number two. He had a tough time against the Tigers in the top of the first, gave up a leadoff double and had a pair of walks, but somehow only gave up one run. This one hit in the air, left side. Foul ground. Rendon is given chase, looks up, and can't get to it. Rick Haig was late to the party. And now it looks like Rendon may have twisted an ankle. Uh, yeah, I, I think that Rick Haig got him on the way by. I think Haig might have spiked him on the way by because he was okay. And Haig kind of comes out of nowhere at the end. Haig's taking a more direct line to it. And you can see Rendon had to kind of peel off and go deep. And I, I, I think that's what happened. Watch Haig at the end. See Haig coming in right here? Right there, he steps on his right foot, and that's when he goes down. You can see the left foot of Haig come in and get Rendon on the, on the right foot. I mean, right here, he's okay. Nothing spins right there. 
comes in and clips him right at the end. And, and I mean, if you're Haig, he's not really looking for Rendon in this. You can really see it right here. Watch. See it right there. So oh. got him and spun his ankle over. You hope mm -hmm. he just sprained it. And Rendon is a guy that this team can ill afford to lose. Their player of the year from the league. Great defensive third baseman. And even though he's just a freshman, he is a leader on that oh. team. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a role he's really grown into this year. And, and I mean, so often, especially for kids that are that young, I mean, you become a leader because of the player you are. And with that brings so many, so much more respect. Watch his mouth right here. This is what's scary. Watch what he says. It's broken. The first thing he said when the trainer got out there, he looked at her and said, it's broken. And it, I mean, you could see it turn over. And obviously, we can't tell from here. And you hope it's just a sprain. And sometimes, we've all sprained our ankles. Sometimes that can hurt just as much as anything else. But I. I mean that took him down in a hurry and he's not putting any weight on it. I don't think he's gonna be able to go. And for Haig, I mean it's you, you're just trying to make a play. I mean he's not really gonna look out for him there. He's looking for the ball, and yeah, that's that is a killer for Rice right there. Wayne Graham's eyes just light up when he talks about Anthony Rendon, one of the best players he's ever had as a hitter, as a defensive player, and he's a true freshman. And now it looks like he is coming out of the game for good. And they're going to come and carry him off. Ovation from the crowd here in Baton Rouge, always some of the classiest fans in college yep. baseball. Well, I mean, they know what kind of a player this kid is. They saw him last night. He struck out as only a bat today, but this is, I mean, really one of the most exciting players that we're going to have in college baseball for the next couple of years. Remember the name. He's just a freshman. By the time he's a junior, I mean, if he stays healthy and hopefully, obviously, gets through this, I mean, this kid's a lock first rounder. He is a great, great talent, a wonderful kid, too. We got to spend some time with him the other day, and, and you hope this is a spot that isn't, isn't anything more than just a spring. Rendon, the first player in Conference USA history to be named the freshman of the year and the player of the year in the same season. 20 home runs, leads the team. Did a big home run last night. Hit a home run over Southern Miss in the Conference USA title game to help. Rice win that turn and now Wayne Graham has to make a, a move here as he has lost his star player coming in is Jimmy Camarada over to third base and Jess Binger is going to go to first and if you try to find a positive in this at least you, you bring a senior in and Binger Camarada is a guy that has really played everywhere in the infield. He played a lot of second base last year, was the regular second baseman for Rice. This year they moved him to first because Holt was so good there. So they had such a great defensive infield all the way around. When we talked to Wayne Graham the other day, he said, We've got four shortstops. So now you move Camarada to third base, and you can bring the senior Binger in, who played a big part in the Rice team last year. But none of them are going to do what Rendon gives you the ability to do at third. Ball and two strikes to Sean Ochenko. <laughs> Wayne Graham was telling us this week that uh, Rendon has wrists that remind him of Hank Aaron. And Wayne Graham got up to the major leagues back in the mid 60s, played with the Phillies, played with the Mets. He saw Hank Aaron play in person. And that's a heck of a compliment for a guy that's 19 years old. Yeah. And what you saw when Rendon was at the plate is, is just how quick his hands are. Had a lot of movement. I mean, not as much as a guy like a Sheffield where his hands are kind of whipping back and forth, but feet were kind of going back and forth. His hands are going back and forth, but they got in the right spot. Camarada showing he's ready to play the hot corner. He dives when he doesn't even have to. Wayne Graham calls him Jimmy Baseball. He said this guy when he shows up on the field is just I mean it's it's like the kid's been playing the game since he was born. 
plugged the hole at second base for him last year. It was a regular first baseman this year now with the injury to Rendon. He's laying out on the first ball he sees at third. 2-2 two, two to Ochinko, and they got him. Strikeout number two for Ryan Berry. If you just tuned in, moments ago, the Rice Owls lost their star player. It looked harmless enough as Rendon, number 23, suffered a right ankle injury chasing after that foul ball. See the shortstop, Haig, come over. He's watching the ball. Rendon's watching the ball. Nobody really sees each other. And it's like the left foot of Haig that came down on the right ankle, and you could see it turn over right after that. He was carried off the field, and it's a good bet that if this series goes three games, Rice would be without Anthony Rendon. Down the line, just outside of the bag, off the bat of Derek Helene. All in a strike to the LSU number eight hitter. One out here for the Tigers as they lead it one nothing. They got a run in the top of the first. Boy, that really got in close on Helene. All the way to the backstop, two and one. Where's uh, where's this pitch count at here? Well, it's way too high, especially if you're Wayne Graham right now. Before the game, he said, you know what, we've got to get a deep outing from Barry. He's got to go a long ways because they, they used five pitchers last night, four guys out of the bullpen. And Barry's a guy that historically has given the ability to go deep in the game. He said, you know what, we haven't had anybody go over 125 pitches, but twice this year he said we might need that tonight from Barry but he's got to go deep in this game for us to have a chance 2-2 Two -two to Derek Helene off the end of the bat Mike Ogilo was the uh, starter last night for Rice and he was fine through four but got knocked out in the fifth Taylor Wall came in he is the number three starter for Rice and he was roughed up right away gave up the three run home run to Schimpf LSU sent 11 men to the plate in the fifth, scoring six runs, and, and the floodgates were open, and LSU never looked back. Floodgates were open, and the fans got into it. That was one of the biggest things last time. When this crowd got into it, LSU was really good. And now Helenihi has forced Berry into a 3-2 count. Helenihi getting the start at third for LSU tonight. Was the starter in right field last year. Another guy that's moved around. And Paul Maneri pushing the buttons. As Barry battles and gets his third strikeout. Elevates the fastball right here. Gets Helene in a 3 2 count and takes advantage of Helene he being a little bit anxious at the plate. That's just a little bit out of the zone, not much. I thought it was a little bit higher before we saw the replay. Watch when this ball comes across about Bell High. Pretty good pitch to hit if you're Helene. But what Barry does so well is the ability to change speeds. Even though he throws 90 91, it makes it look harder. And he gets ahead in the count here to Austin Nola. Freshman shortstop in the number nine spot for the Tigers. And I think because the momentum was interrupted by the injury to Rendon, we cited the fact that Ryan Barry has found the strike zone now. He has struck out three hitters in a row. You knew it was going to happen, and that's what I was saying in the first inning. If you're LSU, you had you got to take advantage of situations like that because it's not very often that Barry's going to lose his control. You don't walk 15 guys in the amount of innings he did this year, 75 or 80 innings, unless you can really spot it, and he can really spot it. And he's done it for three years. So with guys like that, mechanically there might be something that's just off. Either they're rushing a little bit to the plate, or they don't feel quite comfortable on the mound. But over time, and usually it doesn't take very long. They're going to get comfortable out there and get locked back into the zone. Barry's been that way again in this inning. He struck out Mitchell to end the first. And he's been able to get Ochenko and Helenihi so far here in the second on strikes. And it stays one and two to Nola. You know, what I like about Barry is just, we were talking about it a minute ago, just how simple it is. I mean, watch this. It looks like he's just playing catch. I mean, there's not a lot going on. The leg kick's not very high, real easy, simple, good, solid follow through. Locks that front leg out when he goes to home plate. It's pretty quiet mechanics. Two and two. That's what you like to see because it's easier to do the same thing over and over again. Barry, uh, according to Wayne Graham, says he walks to the beat of a different drummer. Gives up a base hit here toward the gap for Nola. 
He'll round first. He's going to try for second. Here comes the throw. It's late. It's a two-out double for Austin Miller. Well, the freshman was put in there a couple months ago by Paul Manera because of his defense, but he's come up with some big hits for this LSU team in the last couple weeks. Had two giant hits last week in the regional one to give him the win against Baylor. Now, two outs, nobody on, comes up with a big two-out double, and I like that's a good time, too. You try to take a chance at second base. You're the nine-hole guy. You're going to turn the order around, even if you get thrown out. You take a chance right there. Now a guy in scoring position with two outs, you can score on a single. Well, May, he doubled his last time up, and he scored the only run of the game. And Barry starts him with a strike. D.J. LeMay here. Starter at shortstop all of 2008, but now at second base. He and Nola make a pretty good middle infield tandem. <laughs> Chopper to short. Short hop. Nice job by Haig to stay with it. Oh, what a play at first by Jess Binger to get the tag on the runner. He just came in after the injury to Rendon, and what a play. It's the advantage you get with a senior coming in in a spot like this. He's been in similar situations and bails him out right here. one nothing LSU, but Rice without their star now. The Lakers defended their home court advantage in game one. Now Kobe Bryant just three wins from a fourth rank. But the Magic have thrived in the underdog role throughout the playoffs. And Dwight Howard's team knows how to fight back. It came to the NBA Finals. Coverage begins tomorrow at 7.30 Eastern on ABC. Kobe absolutely went off in game one. 40 points. Stars have star-like performances when games mean the most. That's Kobe Bryant. They knocked Orlando around in that first game, too. Yeah. I mean, the Magic came in on fire. Rice goes to hit here in the bottom of the second. And for the rest of this game, they're going to be without Anthony Rendon. And it's a good bet that if the series goes another yeah. game, that uh, they're going to be without him tomorrow, too. He suffered an ankle injury. His right ankle was turned on a foul ball play last inning. And he was carried off the field. Michael Fuda leading off here for the Owls. It'll be Fuda, Sultzbaugh, and Manuel to hit for Rice. Lewis Coleman buries a strike there. It's one and two. The Tigers are in front of their home fans. Over 9,000 of them again here tonight. But they're the visiting team, and they're not in their usual dugout or their locker room, which is beautiful, by the way. Brand new here at Alec Box, just like everything else. And things the NCAA does. If you're the home team, you're on one side designated. If you're the visiting team, you're on the other side, and you stay in those clubhouses. Strikeout number two for Lewis Coleman. A little bit of everybody helping him out today, too. So that's what it looks like generally when LSU's in there. But we had to make some changes today. Look at this name place. Now they roll in. Now watch who comes out to help here in a minute. Look at this. How about that? The guy does everything around here. And there's the finished product and Rice coming in. It's a, it's a shame they had to cover up that beautiful locker room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would assume Rice liked it a little bit better with the curtains out than the way it was before, though. Saltzbaugh hitting now for Rice. It's a ball and a strike. You know, what's funny is they weren't even using it. I mean, they were done with BP, and they were sitting in the dugout. And I mean, you're not used to stuff like that on the road anyway. LSU had to get all its stuff out of the locker room. And move to the visitor's side. We'll show you that in just a second. Here's the 2-1 to Saltzbaugh. Three and one. Saltzbaugh last night was one for four. He had a solo home. And probably the hottest hitter next to Rendon in this Rice lineup. The guy that we talked to Wayne Graham the other day, he said, this kid's on fire. We, we always got to make sure that we've got him in there. I like 
kept him at eighth just because he had, he had been comfortable at eighth in the lineup. And last night hit a ball where it looked like Rice might run away and hide with that game. Gave him a 4 1 lead. Tough play there for LeMayhew. And it's going to be an infield hit for Soltzba as he put it right in the right spot on that right side. He did, but Ochenko at first base has to break to make this play. And his first movement was to the bag. Watch him kind of halt right there. You see, you see him break to the base. And maybe he breaks to the base, he has no chance to get to this ball. As a first baseman, you got to go get everything he can and trust that the pitcher's going to get over there in time. But it was too far for the second baseman, LeMayhew, to go. But once that first movement from Ochenko was towards first base, there's no way he has enough time to get back there. So a man on with one out and Craig Manuel to hit for the first time in this Super Regional. Getting the start behind the plate for the Owls. He is a freshman from Satellite Beach Florida a late recruit out of the state of Florida for Wayne Graham. Hit run was on actually the stolen base attempt is going to be out down there at second is this another great throw from Micah Gibbs as Saltzbaugh is retired. It'll be interesting to see if Wayne Graham changes anything now that Anthony Rendon's out. You get a guy in Soltzba who's pretty good speed, but just seven stolen bases on the year. And Manuel, a guy who's been good at the plate, but not great all year. In the first pitch, they try to put the hit and run on, and Soltzba really has no chance. We'll see if he tries to get a little bit more aggressive now with Rendon out of the lineup. One and one to Manuel. Manuel, the backup catcher, to Diego Seastrunk, who is the DH tonight. Here's the visitors' locker room. This is what LSU was supposed to use tonight, but apparently they got dressed somewhere else and said, eh, "We're okay. Skip it. <laughs> We're all right, thanks." Rolled in in full unit. They're ready to go. Lazy fly ball to center. Mata is there to make the catch. And Coleman gives up a hit but faces the minimum in the second. 1-0 LSU. Beautiful night in Baton Rouge. And you're watching ESPN's coverage of the NCAA Baseball Super Regionals presented on ESPN by Capital One. 1-0 LSU as we head to the third inning and we bring in a legend in these parts. Skip Bertman, the former baseball coach and athletic director here at LSU. And coach, it's your first year of retirement from <laughs> LSU Athletics. What have you been doing with all your time? Well, I'm almost retired. I'm uh, raising money uh, for the athletic department and other parts of the university and doing a lot of goodwill stuff and and uh, still enjoy it here. It's a wonderful place and a wonderful school. Well, you're enjoying it here at a different place this year. We saw you last year. We were, you know, maybe a quarter mile right up the road. What a ballpark. Just kind of talk about what this new place has, has, is going to mean to this program. Well, it's been a great uh, vision uh, for about 10 years, and uh, we finally got it done. Uh, you know, we fit a few more thousand in, and we've got a lot yeah. more to do in right field, and we've got some things to do uh, out front. As this one is fouled off by Ryan Shimp. And this one's going to get out of play. We saw an injury down in that side of the field not that long ago, Coach, and uh, wow, that, got a little ugly. Oh, that's uh, that was unfortunate. Uh, the fans, of course, uh, recognized how talented yeah. he was and what a bad break that uh, was for uh, Rice. That was sad to see that. Anthony Rendon leaving the game for the Owls. Yeah, this uh, this ballpark uh, didn't exp uh, didn't spare any expense. <laughs> We raised a lot of money and uh, borrowed some and uh, put in parts of the old box and things that the fans needed. Uh, since it was built by a coach, uh, naturally has a lot of things for Paul and the coaches and the players. <laughs> yeah. Swung and missed, and Shimp goes down, and his strikeout number four for Ryan Barry. Hey, we got to see a lot of those things. I mean, the the, the clubhouse and the, all the the stuff down underneath. A little bit of a change, I would assume, from what it was when when you started over at, at the old Alec Box. What's well, I mean, what have been the biggest changes since you well, started the, coaching it now? Well, uh, in 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 terms of the uh, fans, uh, the weekend we played Florida, we drew more fans in the three days than I had in my first year. Wow, with 35 games. Uh, but I think the changes that we've seen uh, over the years, uh, number one, as I've mentioned to you before, and I must say it again, uh, the popularity of baseball because of ESPN. Yeah. 
and people like yourself that have uh, put it out there for people to enjoy this great game. Uh, on the other hand, I think the officiating has changed. I think it's better coaching. I think there's uh, the travel leagues that have really put us, uh, put baseball players at a higher level, allowed a lot of teams to become very, very competitive, and the NC2A is very happy with the results. One out here for LSU. It's 2-1 to Blake Dean. Swung on. This one is going to get down for a hit. Dean will round first. And it's a one-out single here for LSU. <laughs> Skip, tell me, how do you watch a game now? I mean, what, what are you watching from the sidelines? What kind of sticks out to you as now you watch it as a, as a uh, fan? Uh, as I sit back there, uh, that's a great question. As I sit back there, especially behind home plate, I see pitchers uh, that can throw 2-1, 2-0 breaking balls. Uh, and now you could do that but uh, when you played, but not many could. Uh, you know, mostly all 2-0 and is always a fastball, 3-1 and is always a fastball. Uh, they can really pitch uh, even backwards if they have to today. I see a lot on 95s and 96s where that was very rare. Uh, you know, that was uh, unusual stuff. I see much better hitting uh, than I did then. I think the coaches do a much better job in hitting instruction. Micah Gibbs up there now for the Tigers. Two balls and no strikes. Man on, one out here for LSU, leading 1 0. We're talking with Skip Berkman, legendary head coach of the Tigers, uh, former athletic director. Uh, have you had a chance to kind of reflect on what you were able to accomplish? Uh, yet? Well, uh, well uh, I really do feel good about uh, the rise of baseball uh, in, a, in the nation. I think in the Sun Belt states, uh, or any place that the people want to commit and build a stadium. I think people will come out to watch it. Such a great game played by great kids. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of what's happened here in Louisiana, too. Two and two now to Gibbs. Five national championships, four in the 90s, one in the year 2000. Uh, of those, which one stands out maybe the most? Well, they, naturally, those things never get old, but of course, <laughs> Warren Morris, uh, yeah. 96. Uh, Strike three called out number two and strikeout number five for Barry. With uh, two outs in the ninth, of course, uh, hit a homer's never been done for before or since in the college game. And that was very unusual. He was injured for 42 games. And of course, it was a great story. Uh, that was a great team. And but uh, but as you know, uh, guys, uh, just getting to Omaha is a wonderful thing. Yeah. How about in 1997 when you had to face my partner Kyle <laughs> Peterson? Does that stand out at all? I, I, thought, I, I thought we weren't going to bring that up. I thought we had agreed on that. Uh, Chad, he, he was a great one, but uh, that was a great team. Uh, uh, Here's a ground ball Ma took and thrown out by Camarada. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, Coach, uh, you, you want to stick around? Do you want to sure. talk a little more maybe next inning? Sure. All right, we'll hang on to Skip Burton, the uh, legendary former head coach of the Tigers will continue our chat after the break one nothing LSU alongside Kyle Peterson Clay Mathic back here in Baton Rouge and wow about what the, the Tigers did in the 90s 91 winning the first championship another one in 93 Todd Walker had a big year 96 there's that Warren Morris walk off then in 97 uh, that's when the Tigers got to Kyle Peterson at Stanford and in 2000 <laughs> LSU defeating Stanford again 13-0 uh, and in that postseason and we're joined by Skip Bertman the uh, head coach at that time of the LSU Tigers as Rice hits here at the bottom of the third uh, some great memories there coach uh, wonderful memories Omaha just as a uh, better than the Rose Bowl better than uh, the final <laughs> four yeah uh, it, it's a wonderful play. The NC2A just does such a wonderful job with its committee members in baseball. Uh, in Omaha, the, the people, as you guys know, it, it's just such a wonderful place. Uh, now to spend two weeks there or ten days or just to win a couple games is a great thing for any team. Lewis Coleman deals and catches the corner there. It's a ball and two strikes. You know, Skip, Omaha's home to me now again. We've been back there for a couple years. So I've been able to see this new ballpark coming up, and I know that Rosenblatt holds a real special place in, in your heart. Feelings on that? I mean, seeing the old place go away and a new one come up. As it's a ground ball for Camarada. Nola the throw, and there's one out for Rice here in the third. Wow, nice play. 
The uh, new stadium uh, in uh, Omaha, a lot of people have called me and originally started at 50, 60, 70. And after building this one, uh, as we were <laughs> getting ready to pay yeah. for it, he says, look, you know, yeah. you're going to go way over 100 million to put in uh, this kind of ballpark. When they finally got it done, uh, I'm for that because I think that they can do a lot with the zoo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And make it into world class zoo. I think it's good for the city and they've gosh they've been good to us. Yeah that's a lot of space for that zoo to, to yeah, absorb. Well, that to expand I mean it is going to be great too. I mean when you come in from the airport now it's one of the first things yes. you see kind of start with the city in the in the back. Right. It'll be tough to see the old place go but the new one's going to be pretty yeah. special. Well you know they replace Yankee Stadium and yeah. all the rest of them and uh, I'm as, about as much a traditionalist as anybody but I think the fans uh, deserve uh, and the players that go there deserve better facilities and God bless Rosenblatt Stadium I mean it's did its job there's no question about it. Brock Holt hitting here for Rice. And it's two balls and a strike. Skip what do you think about some of the most recent changes in, in kind of the rules side the limit on the roster to the 35 and the, the different things they're doing on the on the scholarship side you for those you think they're good moves. Well uh, uh, Kyle the, the 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 problem is baseball is the only sport that has a limit you know 35 yeah. I don't really think that's necessary. I think having 27 people on scholarship and eight people that don't have a scholarship I think is also not so good and I think uh, the committee and I think the NC 2 a is working on it. I think it all started yeah. because we didn't have the grades that we really should have had because of the transfer rule and that's been fixed. Hit to right center field going back is Mikey Mato reaching up and can't get it. It's a home run for Brock Holt his second home run in two games. And Rice has tied this one up at one. You know, we talk about Lewis Coleman and the way that he hides the ball. It's a lot more difficult for a right hander and a left hander. For a lefty, yes. you can see that ball a lot quicker. And this time you saw Holt react to it. Fastball, it's not a bad spot. I mean, it's down in the zone. But, Skip, we were talking about right. this during the break. I mean, the difference between a right hander facing Coleman and a left hander facing Coleman, that's a big gap because as a yeah. righty, it's tough to pick up. Yeah, the scouts really uh, commented on that. Like, uh, Lewis is going to have to get uh, some uh, change up, a yeah. pitch that dips. Uh, for the left handers because they can see the ball uh, as you obviously pointed out uh, much better and uh, of course Brock really did hit that one and today the ball's carrying very well. Yeah, it is it's uh, blowing a little bit out that way where Holt hit it. Look out over there now. <laughs> yeah, you almost got a foul ball coach. Oh uh, people would have thrown their body in front of him. <laughs> I mean I was, I'm OK. <laughs> Rick Haig hits here now for Rice as we're tied up. Uh, Coach, have you noticed that this ballpark plays a little bit differently than the old Alec Box? Well, um, soft fly ball to center. Matuk has a short gallop for out number two. Uh, this ballpark uh, does play a little bit. Of the shadows are starting already, as you can see. Yeah. That didn't happen in the old ballpark. Uh, the batter's eye is a little bit different in this one, although I don't think it's a big factor. Uh, but the uh, wind this has a lot more open space and um, it's not as loud overall as the even though there's 2000 yeah. more people as the old one and I think that the does be the old ones a little closer to the river and I think the winds a little different here. Mazingo nice stop by Helene he comes up firing for out number three. What a play by Derek Helene. Coach, thank you very much. Enjoy Thanks. your retirement. We appreciate Thanks. the time. Thanks Great a lot, boys. Yes. We're tied at one. Ryan Burt, Will Kimmy in studio. Southern Miss and Florida continue to go back and forth in Gainesville. 5-5 five, five game, bottom of the fifth row. Yeah, look, Taylor Thompson with the fly ball. Cameron Brunty with a great effort here. Turns into a sack fly, but this game just back and forth. Southern Miss got runners on again now. The two on and one out for Southern Miss. They trail 6-5 in the sixth. Louisville and Fullerton. Fullerton 5-1. They won game one 12 zip, so Fullerton uh, looking good to move on to Omaha. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. We're back here in Baton Rouge, and we've got a tie game now as we move to the fourth inning. Alongside Kyle Peterson, I'm Clay Maffick. As Jared Mitchell for LSU takes ball one. Great to talk with Skip Burton. Yeah. Uh, great interview with him in the third inning, and we had a chance to do that last year during the Super Regionals, and uh, had a better baseball man in the country. He's seen so much. 
I mean, legitimately built this program into, into what it is right now. Five national titles and, and, and I mean, brought so many more eyes to college baseball than were there before. One of the teams during those uh, great teams of the 90s, I think it was the 97 title team, the one that you ran up against, yeah. hit 188 <laughs> home runs yeah. in one season. So That's it, still, it, it was that team. and probably <laughs> always will be a league record, or a NCAA record. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a couple of those off of me. <laughs> a couple more than I would have liked. That was, I mean, that year was incredible. I mean, that was the year that, that Berkman for Rice hit 41 home runs, I think, and, and Brandon Larson for LSU hit 40. It was the following year that SC won the national title game against Arizona State 21 to 14. 21 14 it sounds like a football score and really from that point on is when they started mandating the bats a lot more and the game has come back to what it is right now. Jared Mitchell saw fly. This is going to be a tough play for the shortstop Haig and he can't come up with it and Mitchell will coast into second base. Gotta Tough give him play. a hit on that, right? Yeah, no, I think you absolutely do. And, and I mean, it's almost an impossible play for the shortstop, but it's a play the left fielder has to make. And the problem with Fuda was the first step. When this ball went up, I think he thought the ball was deeper. So he froze, took a step back, and that was the difference between being able to get to that ball. I mean, Haig's got to be 40 feet on the left center field, plus his back's entirely turned, and you got to time it right. That's one where you got to hope your left fielder gets a good jump, because if not, shortstop's in a big hole. Well, they're going to give a double to Mitchell. That was a tough play for Heg, no question. And so now Mitchell in scoring position for Sean Ochenko. One of the five strikeout victims for Ryan Berry so far tonight. He hits. And he strokes it into left field. Mitchell is going to be held up by the third base coach, Javi Sanchez. And it's a good thing because Fuda threw it right on the money to home plate. All right, let's take a look at our Coke Zero game track. And the big news so far tonight, the injury to the star player for Rice, Anthony Rendon. He's gone. This changes this team so dramatically. Rendon hits right in the middle of the lineup. I'm talking to Skip Bertman off camera. Said he was I mean, probably one of the most exciting players in the entire country. But Brock Holtz picked him up. The leadoff hitter now two home runs in two games. LeMay, who started things off with a leadoff double, came around to score. But now... This LSU offense showing some signs. A little bloop double from Mitchell to start it. And that was a pretty good swing by Ochenko right there. At the corners, nobody out for Helenihi. Takes Highland. Helenihi with an excellent play to end the bottom of the third inning at third base. And even got a round of applause from Skip. He deserved it on that one. That was a bullet. Back up the middle. And into center field. Mitchell will score. Going to third is Ochenko, and he is out. Sultzba on the money with the throw from center field to get the out, but a run comes in, and it's 2-1 LSU. Ball that off the bat looks like they have a chance to make a double play, and it's a decision for Hold as to whether or not he can backhand this ball or get in front of it. When it gets by him, the center fielder, Sultzba, though, does not slow down. Absolute strike. The Camarada at third base drops that tag right on the top of Ochenko. And that's a big out for LSU. I mean, you talk about the change. If he stays at second base, you got guys on first and second, nobody out, and a run in. Now with an out, totally changes the entire inning. Pretty good play by Sultz, but to not give up, charge that ball when it's hit up the middle, and then a strike on the Camarada. I've been impressed with Sultz, bro. He's a junior college transfer. He's fit in nicely with this Rice Owls team. Now Austin Nola. A double his last time up. Two forty two on the season. He's raised his average 13 points here in the last two days. Helen Ehe away from second. Fly ball right field. Chad Mazingo. Fighting the sun a little bit out there. Makes the catch for out number two. Ryan Berry, a junior from Humble, Texas, gave up a run in the first inning. Got out of trouble, though. And that's the only run he gave up until here in the fourth. 
the thing we're seeing is that pitch count just continue to go up and look at the difference between these two. I mean almost two to one difference so far. Barry getting close to 80. Now granted he's already gone now two thirds of an inning longer than Coleman. But the gap is just as big when you look at balls and strikes. I mean Coleman about 75 percent strikes to balls and Barry's closer to 50 percent. Even though it's a two to one ball game they've looked a little bit different on the mound so far. Back to the top of the order and D.J. LeMayhew. And Craig Manuel is going to come out for a chat with his pitcher as Jared Rogers, the right-hander, starts to warm up for Rice. I don't think you're going to see Barry come out of this game unless they hang about four or five on him. That or that pitch count gets up north of 120. I mean, he still gives you your best chance to win. He's He's been that guy in the middle of the Rice rotation for the last three years. And I know that Rogers is up and throwing, a kid that's close for him most of the year this year. But I would think Barry's going to go as long as he possibly can today. LeMahieu a double to start the game came around to score the first run. And this one is going to spin out of play down the right field line. The last time up for LeMahieu he grounded to short and the throw was down the line between first and home. But the first baseman Jess Binger slapped a beautiful tag on LeMahieu to end the inning. So just coming into the game. Binger hadn't been in a game for 10 minutes. He gets a play like that over at first base. The thing that sticks out though, the pitch count to Barry so far, and the two walks. I mean, one of them was one that he probably doesn't mind, but Barry, a guy that just historically has not hardly walked anybody. Unless he was regained the lead here in the fourth. Manuel knocks it down. We call time. You were saying before that Manuel's been the uh, designated catcher, so to speak, for Ryan Barry. Kind of a surprise considering Barry's roommates with Diego Sistra. Yeah, I mean, Manuel, too, I mean, he's only a freshman. I mean, a pit kid that came in, they needed a catcher. They found him. He would Pierce saw him in a showcase, called Wayne Graham and said, well, you know, we got to take this kid. He can really receive. He hits enough, and he's definitely hit enough this year. He's hit 300. But as a freshman, has really filled an important role for him. They didn't know who was going to catch. Him. I mean, they Seastrand made the transition in the fall, but Manuel's really done a good job of, of solidifying him at least part of the time. Lemayhew to second. Brock Holt has it. And LSU is done here in the fourth inning, but they get another run. And the Tigers lead it 2-1 as Rice has to win to force a game three tomorrow. Ryan Burr in studio just a reminder the Belmont Stakes about six minutes from now over on ABC Kentucky Derby winner mind that bird is the favorite at Calvin Burrell on board looking to become the triple crown jockey post time 625 once again that over on ABC Clay and Kyle. All right Ryan thank you very much and a reminder the road to Omaha continues on ESPN tomorrow with regional coverage. From the Super Regionals, you're going to see either Texas take on TCU or Virginia and Ole Miss in Game 3. Super Regionals presented on ESPN by Capital One tomorrow at 3 Eastern. That's a pretty good matchups going on. How about Brian O'Connor's Virginia team, too? Fighting back to get two in the eighth off of an error to start the inning and a walk. Both those come around to score. They beat Ole Miss 4-3, and TCU jumps out on top of Texas already. one nothing today. Jess Binger. Put in the lineup after Anthony Rendon suffered an ankle injury. Rendon taken out of the game. And it's the first time he's been taken out of the game all season. Binger to left field. Ryan Schimpf is out there and he's got the play made. One down. Let's go back to the second inning. It was a Harmless enough foul ball that Rendon ran into a shortstop on. You could hear him. Did you hear him that time? Yeah. The minute he got stepped on. What's sad about this too is, is I mean, if, if this ends up something that, that isn't just a sprain, and sadly it doesn't look like it is. I mean, obviously it hurts Rice today, and if they advance, it, it hurts him in Omaha. But I mean, this kid was going to get a chance to do something pretty special this summer as well. It was on the early invite list to Team USA. It was, I mean, you got to think a lock to make the national team. They get a chance to travel around the world and. Wear your country on the front and, and, and continue to play baseball all summer. And I, I, you just feel for him right now. 
Here's the kicker. It's his 19th yeah. birthday today. Yeah. So what a birthday present. And but he's still smiling. Yeah, that's the I mean, thing. It, the guy is the most affable guy yeah. you want to ever meet. He's this kid is. I mean, he's got a chance to do some really special things. He's he's got a perfect temperament. Seastrunk toward the power alley, and it's going to get in for a hit. Mata crashing into the wall out there. Seastrunk still going, trying for three, and he's in with a triple. First hit of the Super Regional for Diego Seastrunk. And Rice has something going here in the fourth. He took a chance right there. He took a big chance right there because Matuk looks like he's got a chance to catch this ball. And I think it goes a lot further than even Seastrunk thought. I mean, it looked like he was out in front of it a little bit. Watch Matuk kind of slows down and thinks he's there. And in the end, can't quite get to it. It's just out of his reach. Seastrunk pulls up, and now he gets going. But I thought he was in trouble right when they were out at second base. I mean, if this throws on line to third base, he's out. It's high, slides in safe, and now Rice back at business. The guy on third here with one out. When we, took to Wayne, when we talked to Wayne Graham about Diego Seastrunk, he said he really swings the bat well against guys on the mound that can really pitch. He just locks him in more and does it right there against Coleman in a big spot. Fourth hit for Rice. And Michael Fuda takes a healthy cut. It's one strike. Fuda struck out back in the second. Fuda, a former two-sport athlete at Rice, he was playing football for the Owls, now concentrating on just baseball. And a suicide squeeze, but it's going to produce a run for the Owls, and Fuda safe. Tied it two here in Baton Rouge on the suicide squeeze by Michael Fuda. You know, you can't time this any better. The base runner does such a good job of kind of working his way down the line on this to see where this bun is, and then Fuda beats it out. I mean, when this ball's down, it was kind of a late break from Seastruck over at third base, and it might have been a safety squeeze to wait and see where that ball was down the right field line, but on the safety, you want to wait, and if it gets past the pitcher, or at least far enough out, you're going to take off. It was timed perfectly good by Seastruck. And a perfect call by Wayne Graham. Looked like it caught everybody off guard. Now Coleman dealing to Sultzba. He sends it. Foul ground right side. And Jared Mitchell, as we can see now, that's a tough play yeah. over the uh, mound out there in the bullpen. It's, I mean, it looks very easy when a guy's running over there. But with these bullpens down the right and left field line as an outfielder, you're not looking down as much. If you hit the warning track early, you know you're going to get close. But in his case, Mitchell's looking up, watching for the ball, and watch. He's going to go from grass right onto the outfield dirt, and he can't look down. I mean, if he looks down at that point, looks back up, you don't have enough time to catch the ball. So I mean, he's got to kind of guess a little bit where he's at. He made what's a pretty tough play down the right field line look real easy because you see a lot of guys fall right on their nose right mm -hmm. there. Runner goes. Here comes the throw from Gibbs, and in time he got him on the tag. Austin Nola with a beautiful tag to get Fuda. And Rice is done here in the fourth, but they get a run. A triple by Diego Seastrunk. But how about the freshman with the tag to end the inning? Game two of the Super Regional in Baton Rouge, tied at two, LSU and Rice. As we go to the fifth inning, and here is Wayne Graham, the head coach of the Owls, and the coach we saw, Anthony Rendon, carried off the field in the second inning. What uh, is his status? Well, I think they're uh, x raying it. There's a possibility of a fracture. We don't know yet. Wayne, how about Ryan Berry on the mound? I mean, he struggles a little bit with his control in the first inning. It looks like he's, he's settled in a little bit. From, from your standpoint, what have you seen? Well, I hope he settled in. Uh, that's un he was uncharacteristically wild early in the game, but I think his stuff is good. He, he couldn't get his breaking ball down earlier, and uh, you know the runs they've got off of him were largely a result of blue hits or scratch hits. So hopefully he'll settle down. All right, coach. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wayne. Wayne Graham. And first pitch from Barry is high to Ryan Shimp, the number two hitter for the Tigers, hitting here in the top of the fifth. As uh, you know, it's, it's been a tough break here for the Rice Owls, and certainly uh, nobody feels worse about it than Wayne Graham as uh, 
we talked about how he feels about his star player and now he's uh, enjoying a hamburger there on the bench. It's hungry. Don't blame him. It's I mean it just speaks to the kid right there. We were talking about his temperament earlier. To walk the shift to lead off the fifth inning. Really laid back when you talk to him. And to me, I mean, the biggest testament of what he's done this year is the respect that he's gained from the guys around him. I mean, you gain respect because of what you do on the field, but the respect was beyond that. I mean, it was almost looking at him as one of the leaders of this team. We talked about it earlier, and that doesn't simply come from stats. It comes from the way that you handle yourself and the way that you carry yourself around other guys on the team. And you can tell that he's been accepted into that leadership role just as a freshman. Even if it's not a fracture, the chances of him playing tomorrow, no. if there is a game three, it's going to happen. Pretty slim. I don't think it'll happen. Dean has a single and two plate appearances. And Barry checks Schimpf over at first. And we talked about it yesterday, Kyle, about Blake Dean and, and the kind of year it's been for the LSU designated hitter. He was hitting 225 March 21st, but his average has come up about 105 points. Here he pulls this one down the line, but well fouled. Uh, his power numbers are what you would expect for Blake Dean. His average is back to respectability and then some. 65 runs batted in. Somewhere along the line there, late March, the light just came on. I think one of the things that gets looked at a little bit too much in college baseball is guys that that start slow over 20 games. And remember, if we're talking about a big league season, 20 games is a sixth of the year, an eighth of the year. I mean, it's you know it's less than a month, but in the college season, it's a third of the year, and so I think it's looked at a little bit differently. Slumps take time to come out of, and as the year went on, Dean did what he's done here. He's hit. You know that he's going to do it over a period of time. It just you know, took him 25 games to do it. Now he's swinging a bat as well as anybody in that club. Graham out to talk with Barry. This is the second trip to the mound. First this inning. Now the College World Series returns to Omaha, Nebraska. The action beginning on Saturday, June 13th. That's a week from today at 2 o'clock Eastern live on ESPN HD. For more information on the 2009 College World Series, go to NCAA.com, the official online home for all 88 NCAA championships. And just as he did, Earlier in the game, that was in the first inning. Wayne Graham is going to leave his starter in. He was talking to him about his finger. I saw earlier in the game, Barry was kind of looking at his index finger. I don't know if he's got a blister going on or his nails breaking a little bit, but it looked like they were looking at his right finger, his right index finger. They have an interesting relationship, Graham and Barry. It's uh, it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> Yeah. It's one of respect, certainly. There's a lot of respect. And, and, I mean, Barry's earned it because of what he's done the last three years. Wayne Graham is a conservative guy, runs a tight ship. He's got to, he's got some ideas of what a ball player should look like, especially with the facial hair. And as you can <laughs> see, uh, Ryan Barry hasn't seen a razor in a while. But Coach told Ryan, he said, you know, if your ERA is two or below, you can do whatever you want with your facial hair. And it has been. Yeah, he's been right on that number. <laughs> There was a time though earlier in the season where it got a little ridiculous where he had the mutton chops and a mustache. And I don't think Wayne liked that really much at all. That was funny when he was talking about it the other day he said I he said I don't really understand what he did. He said he just it's like he just shaved his chin and nothing else and he said it looked terrible. <laughs> Barry even admitted. And it was gone soon after that but I mean, Wayne's a guy too that I mean played a lot of pro ball and and for you know, I think as, as a traditionalist as, as he is he also understands you've got to give guys room and I think he does a real good job of that as well toward the gap off the bat of Dean food is over there to play it and Dean is into second with a double second and third nobody out for LSU second hit today for Blake Dean and the Dean's going well this is one of the things he could do to you and really hit the ball with authority to left center field a little fastball that's tailing out away from him and puts a perfect swing on it let's step ball traveler gets real deep into his swing and this 
Ball sit real well out to left center field. Food almost overruns this ball. I mean, does a good job just to get a bare hand on it, keep it in front of him. That keeps Shimp at third base, but now LSU just keeps coming here. A run in the fourth to take the lead. Rice ties in the bottom half. Now they have the first two guys on here, but nobody out in the fifth. Jared Rogers continues to work in the Rice bullpen. As Micah Gibbs comes to the plate, a walk and a strikeout. So far tonight for the cleanup hitter for the Tigers. And he takes ball one. Gibbs misses being draft eligible this year by just two days. And boy, is Paul Maneri happy about <laughs> that. Broke Paul's heart, I'm sure. Back up the middle. I think Barry got a piece of it. This will score a run as Gibbs is thrown out. Let's go to the studio with Ryan Burr. Ryan Burr along with Will Kimmy. Back and forth they go in Gainesville. Florida and Southern Miss a 7-6 game. And Will, Southern Miss puts a four spot up in the sixth. Yeah, Corey Stevens, one of four seniors on the team, rips one into the gap, and this is just a merry-go-round of base runners both ways. 9-6 now, Southern Miss on top, top of the seventh inning. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, here it is 3-2 now as LSU has regained the lead. And now the number five hitter, Mikey Matuk, to hit for the Tigers. A uh, little bit more on Southern Miss head coach Corky Palmer retiring, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Eagles would love to give him a great present by... Uh, sending him to Omaha. Down the line, into the corner, and just foul. The first base umpire, Mitch Mealy, on the call. They just missed, and this place would have gone bananas. I mean, they were just waiting to explode when a ball came off the bat of Matuk. We've talked a lot about Rendon, rightfully so. I mean, he is the most impressive freshman in the country. Matuk's done some pretty special things, too, for this LSU team. Watch how close this is. That's about three feet down the right field line. Good eyes by Mitch Mealy over at first base. Worked his way down the line. Make sure he had a clean shot at it. That one got Paul Maneri off the bench in a hurry because that would have been a game changer. As it is, it's two strikes now to Matuk. Fights that one. You know, Matuk uh, is built like a football player. 6'1", 195. His dad, Mike, played football at LSU in the 80s. Unfortunately, he passed away from a heart condition at a young age. But Mikey has a big family. His mom, twin sisters, and especially his dad, brothers, very supportive, probably here tonight. Goes after that one and strikes out. Out number two. And strikeout number six for Barry. It's exactly what Barry's thinking in that spot. With the infield drawn in and one out, you're looking for a strikeout. You don't want to take a chance. A guy putting this ball in play can shoot it past a drawn in infield, so he does a good job of elevating. And look at the freshman catcher manual. How he's almost standing up before that ball came in, trying to coax the ball from Barry to be up in the zone. Like when catchers do that, get exactly where they want that ball. He was standing up, making sure that ball was up and out of the zone. Mitchell is going to spin this one foul. He is one for two. Had a double his last time. Out. Came around to score. Here comes pitch 100 on the night for Ryan Berry. And he's ahead to Mitchell, two strikes. Jared Mitchell, the junior from New Iberia, Louisiana. Here's our ESPNU campus connection. Daddy owes his nickname, and he likes gumbo. I like gumbo, too. A lot of good to go get some tonight. A lot of good food here in Baton Rouge. We're going to go get some, some Cajun food tonight. What did uh, Chris Giot bring in? Did you check that out? Yeah, yet? I peeked at it. We got some, I'm going to wait on it. We got some frog legs in there and gator something. And sometimes you just don't ask. I mean, I... I, I I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that I want to know everything that's in there, but I know it's it's good every time. One, two. That's going to get all the way to the backstop. Off the glove of Manuel. It's going to allow the run to come in. It's Blake Dean, and it's now four to two, Tigers. I 
a plus count I think to Barrett was trying to throw this ball out of the zone to see if he could get Mitchell to chase but you're not trying to throw it here I mean it was it looked like it was a change up that just got away from him came right out from between the grip and the freshman probably a ball he should have had but definitely not anywhere close to where Barry wanted that ball and just uncharacteristic uncharacteristically wild today he has not been able to repeat very often that's something that Ryan Barry can usually do throw the ball in the same spot time after time but it seems like one time the mechanics and the ball come out of his hand perfect and the next time he struggles it's the first time that LSU has put up a crooked number here tonight we have seen Ryan Berry in trouble before in this game and he's managed to basically work his way out of it but this time two across for LSU and the Tigers aren't done yet it's a walk to Mitchell you know what he did right there to me says volumes about what Barry has had today from a struggle standpoint. 3 2 count and he drops down. And the arm, arm angle kind of come down low three quarters. And, and to a guy like Mitchell, who's a good hitter, but Barry usually can really control the zone. When you try to get tricky with a guy in that spot, you're not comfortable out there. Watch this. See how he kind of drops down, goes low three quarters. He hadn't done that the entire game. If you're doing that in a 3 2 count against a guy that is not one of the top power hitters in the country, you're not comfortable out there. That's not when you change things. You can tell he's just trying to find something to where he can be consistent out there. Now Sean Ochinko to hit. Barry is an engineering major at Rice. I mean he is a smart guy. But you think maybe right there trying to overthink it a bit? Brown ball to short. This should end the inning. I think he did. I mean, it's when he's comfortable, he's throwing a ton of strikes. He's just looking for that consistency tonight. He just hadn't found it yet. Two for LSU. They have the lead. We talk with the coach next. LSU four, Rice two. The Tigers one win away from going to Omaha as we talk with their head coach, Paul Maneri, in his third year on the job here in Baton Rouge. And, Coach, you, your team has the lead. What was the game plan tonight against their right-hander, Ryan Berry? Well, Barry is a, he challenges you. He comes right at you with the fastball. He throws that splitter or slider, whatever he's throwing once he gets ahead in the count for the most part. But, he, you know, we've had some opportunities. We've just let go by the wayside and only because he's, he's challenged us and we haven't come through. But we were able to scratch a couple across there with Blake's doubles leading the way. How about Lewis Coleman on the mound tonight? I mean, you know, has, has thrown a lot of strikes, really Holt, the, the one real good swing for Rice, but what have you seen from the sun? Well, I think he's thrown well. Uh, you know, it's a hitter's day today. It's nice and warm. The ball's really hopping. So, you know, their kid took advantage of it being ahead in the count, and Lewis had to throw a strike. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Paul. Paul Maneri as Craig Manuel fouls one off here. He leads off for Rice in the bottom of the fifth as the Owls are down two runs. You know, Paul Maneri, and we didn't talk to Skip Bertman about this. We wanted to go there, but we ran out of time. He was hired by Skip. As this one is going to be just fouled down the line. And what an interesting situation that must have been for Skip. He's got to hire the successor for the program that he built, hoping that he's leaving it in good hands. And certainly here in year number three, it appears that he made a great choice. Well, he did, and, and you got to remember, Smoke Laval came in the middle, and, and that's one of the reasons why they went out and got Paul Maneri. Smoke Laval was was the assistant to Skip for a long time, was kind of seen as the successor, and you know, wasn't really going along the way that they wanted it down here. They're bringing in Paul Maneri, who took Notre Dame to the College World Series, and they've been really good. I mean, took him a year. Last year in year two, he's national coach of the year. They go to Omaha. This year, they're a national seed. Uh, and in my opinion are, are one of the favorites to win the whole thing. He's got a really good club and has built it back in a real short period of time. Just miss it. And it's now a 3 2 count on Manuel. Paul Maneri with some Louisiana roots. As this one is hit toward the gap in right center field, playable for Mata, makes the catch. One down. Maneri played one year in the mid 70s here at LSU, then transferred away and also spent a couple of years at the University of New Orleans. And I have to think that that helped oh, yeah. when he was uh, applying for this job. And this is a, there's a lot of special jobs around the country, but this one. 
stands out above most and a lot of it is because of the eyes that it brings with it. And obviously there's great baseball history. We talked with Skip Bertman today. He's one of the main reasons why. But with that has come increased attendance increased coverage. I mean, we were talking about today in the newspaper. I mean, there was three full pages of coverage yeah. on the game yesterday. Camerata taps it foul. So you got to have a guy that not only can coach and recruit but can handle all of the other ancillary things that go with it. And there's more here than there is probably anywhere else in the entire country. And that's why I think it makes a difference. You bring a guy in who has a history. Here. National coach of the year last year Paul Maneri. Another foul ball off the bat of Camerata the number nine hitter for Rice. He is 0 for 1 tonight. The way Camarada's fighting that off, too. I mean, we talked about how tough it is for a right hander to see the ball off of Coleman. That was really bearing in on Camarada. And that time he got the barrel to it. I mean, he hit it foul, but got the barrel to it. Hit it with some authority. Ball and two strikes. Rice has to win this game to force a game tomorrow night here in Baton Rouge. They don't get it done. LSU is off to the College World Series for the second time under Paul Maneri and for the second straight year. Strikeout number three for Lewis Coleman. Two down. Brock Holt had a home run yesterday and a home run here tonight. Quick swing from the left side. Wayne Graham talked about his power when we talked to this earlier this week about this Rice team we've seen it both times really ripped to right field this one started it off today fastball down and in lead off hitter goes deep to start to that back in the third inning for Rice but I to me everything hold is hit to the right side has been hit with authority single to start the game goes deep in the third inning but it's because of that short swing and the ability to plug hold in at second base has allowed him to solidify the infield move Camarada around a little bit as well. Hits this one sharply through the hole on the right side. And it's a two out single third hit of the game for Brock Holt. As his average is right around 350 now on the year. Kind of hangs over the plate too. I mean, stands right on top of it. His hands are hanging out of a plate. Dares you to throw that ball inside. But what he's trying to do is get everything he can to pull. Tell he's more comfortable hitting anything to the right side. Hey, go for one. It's been on once after being hit by a pitch in the first. Holt over there at first. <laughs> Strike one. Lewis Coleman. Drafted by the Nationals last year in the 14th round, turned it down to come back to LSU. And Tigers certainly glad he did. He's 12 and 2 coming into this game and has pitched well for the Tigers so far tonight. Well, that hit him again. That got him. So second time Haig has been hit by a pitch tonight from Lewis Coleman and both times on fastballs and both times in almost the exact same spot I mean, you can tell what the book is they're trying to throw fastballs inside to Haig but the problem with Coleman is is if it gets away from him on the inside part of the plate see how far that ball moves I mean that starts over the inside half because his hand is kind of getting around it and not getting over the top of the ball the ball is a ton of runs so it's staying pretty flat but has a ton of run and it runs right into the right handed hitters and Rick Haig is showing he's not going to move. He's going to throw that fastball inside and it's going to bear down on him. He'll take it and take first base. Now on for the second time. So now Chad Mazingo to hit for Rice. Mazingo, eight home runs on the year. I think this is where you have to get him. You've got to get Coleman from the left side because it's just such a easier look from a left-handed hitter. Right-handers not going to hit him very often. So your left handers really have to take advantage of the fact and we heard Skip Bertman talk about it when he was on. He, he doesn't have anything that's soft that's going to go away from him. He's primarily a, a sinker slider guy. So if he throws an off speed pitch it's going to come back in towards the barrel. Left handers in this Rice lineup. So in this case Holt Mozingo and Seastrunk really have to take advantage of that. 
One strike. Checked his swing back to Coleman, who does a nice job coming off the mound and a strong throw. And again, Coleman showing some emotion coming off. Rice strands two. It's 4 2 LSU. Orion Burr, Will Kimmy in studio, 141st running of the Belmont, and Summer Bird wins 25 80 for the winner, Dunkirk. Comes in second. Mind that bird. The favorite gets the show. College baseball. Texas in TCU. Michael Torres showing some power, Will. That's just his third of the year. Texas, not a home run hitting team, but hey, it's the postseason. That's what Texas does. They'll take it. 3-1 Texas over TCU. That on ESPNU, guys. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. And a reminder, the NBA Finals continue on ABC tomorrow night. Game one, Kobe and the Lakers really took it to the Magic. Now Orlando trying to regroup and steal home court in game two. Coverage of game two begins with the GMC NBA countdown. It's at 7.30 Eastern Sunday, 4.30 Pacific over on ABC. LSU to hit now here in the sixth inning. It's 8-9 and 1 for the Tigers leading 4-2. Derek Hellenihi, two balls and no strikes at the plate. He has an RBI single to his credit tonight. His big contribution for LSU this postseason, a three-run homer against Bama in the SEC tournament. That was on May 21st. It proved to be the game winner. He came into the game last night as a defensive replacement. And even some of the non-starters can be big players this time of the year, Kyle. They absolutely can, and Helen e, he's a guy who was a starter last year. I mean, starter for a lot of the year for this LSU team and played a big part in their run to Omaha. But a guy that as the season went on, kind of a, a background role, but now if you can plug him back in, it's great to have that kind of experience. Freshman Tyler Hanover started playing a lot of third base. Helen e, he was relegated to a backup role. And this is hit very deep to right field. Has a chance to get out of here and does. Leadoff solo home run for Derek Helenihi, and it's 5-2 Tigers. I forget backup, bro. You start swinging a bat like this, Helenihi's going to stay right in the lineup for LSU. And Talk about the big home run he had in the regional. How about the ability to take the ball the other way? Barry coming in, fastball away, and Helene, he takes advantage of the right spot to hit the ball. The ball's going to fly to right field. I mean, the flags are not blowing all that hard in center, but you get it up in the outer right, you've got a chance, and it just has not been Ryan Barry's day. He just has not looked comfortable. And now he hits Nola. And Wayne Graham is at the top of the dugout, and he's going to make his way out. And Barry at times able to wiggle out of trouble here tonight, but looks like it's going to be all for Ryan here in the sixth. Call to the bullpen. Jared Rogers set to pitch for the Rice Owls. Another run for the Tigers of LSU. They lead it by three. Back in a moment. of the NCAA Baseball Super Regionals presented by Capital One. Follow us on the road to Omaha on Facebook and on Twitter. Search ESPN College World Series on Facebook for all of the great behind the scenes stuff there. And then my good buddy here, KP, Kyle Peterson, is giving you great stuff on Twitter. And he's going to continue to do that in his great hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. So are you going to take that thing home with you to the computer at night and make sure that no. everybody knows what your thoughts are after the yeah, day is we, over we while you're relaxing? A little bit last night. A little bit last night. Did some today during the early games. We're trying to get some stuff on there every now and then. Okay. I'm watching most of these games anyway, man. That's right. Can't turn them off. That's a tough day for Ryan Berry. And really not what we expected to see, I don't think. What sticks out the most is the four walks. I mean, he at times can give up some hits, although he hasn't done it very often this year. 
But four walks to me is is the telltale sign with Barry because he just didn't have the ability to control it. Now they go to the bullpen and Jared Rogers. Who you get two Rogers in the bullpen. Jordan Rogers was the closer for most of the year for this Rice team. Jared Rogers, a big kid, a junior college transfer, pretty good stuff. Numbers aren't great. This 675 year he's given up more hits than in each pitch, but not a lot of walks. And in this case, I think that's what you want if you're Wayne Graham. Just somebody can come in and throw strikes. And LeMahieu lays it down. Rogers throws it to first for the out. But Nola's able to move into scoring position. Sacrifice for LeMahieu. One out. Again, if LSU can win this here tonight, they're off to him. And you and Skip mentioned this when we talked to Coach Burtman in the third inning. Changes that are happening in Omaha. Last couple of years at Rosenblatt, so if you get a chance yeah. to go this year and next. Go check it out. Just two more out. years. Two more years. New ballpark being built right downtown. It'll be beautiful, too. I mean, right downtown Omaha. Ryan Schimp takes down and in one ball and no strikes. Not going to be Rosenblatt. You never, never replace the old one. And you know what? I mean, it's they're doing it for the right reasons. It keeps the College World Series in Omaha for the next 27 years, which is great. Two more years and another 25-year commitment from the NCAA. That's where it ought to go. Should never leave. The city's really adopted it, and I think the game's really adopted the city. This is going to skip away from Manuel, get all the way to the backstop. Lemayhu now just. 90 feet away, or excuse me, a Nola, I should say, 90 feet away from another LSU run. You see the freshman Manuel really trying to work back there. The fastball that goes about 58 feet. And as a catcher, there's just nothing you could do except try to throw your body in front of it. That ball's a good foot inside. Manuel try to throw his body over there and get something in front of it, but when it hits that far out in front, you really got to guess as far as where the first bounce goes and just shot over the top of his shoulder. Tapper back to the mound and they've got Nola hung up. They tag him out and now going into second base smartly is Shim. And that is a well executed rundown. It is a well executed rundown but I think it's a spot here if you're the freshman you got to let this ball get past the pitcher. I mean a lot of times their base coach will tell you one of two things either anything on the ground or anything on the ground past the pitcher and in this spot I assume they told him anything on the ground but I, I, I think you got to try to wait until this ball gets past the pitcher because there's just no chance. I mean it's it's not hit at all and you can see he's breaking on impact. So the minute he sees that ball go down Nola's breaking from third base at least does a good enough job to stay in a run down long enough for our shimp to get out to second. But I third base in that spot I, I like forcing that ball to get past the pitcher because on any ball back to him he has that much time and he just, he got no chance to score. You know, intentionally walk Blake Dean, who's been on base twice tonight, a pair of hits, a single, and a double and a run score. And they're going to take their chances with Micah Gibbs. He doesn't have a hit tonight, but he did drive in a run his last time up. And the decision here. I think it's a good move. I mean, Dean's taking some pretty good swings today. He has two hits at the ball in the, in the gap to left center field, and this is probably one of the most dangerous two or three hitters on this LSU team. I mean, I like Gibbs. I think he's a heck of a hitter, but I think you play the percentages. Dean's one of those guys that you circle in this LSU lineup. Probably at this point, he and Schimpf, where you say those two aren't going to beat us, and you're going to take your chances with Gibbs. So Gibbs comes up two on and two out as we take a look at the bracket Arkansas the first to punch a ticket to Omaha winning earlier today over Florida State to eliminate the Seminoles and the winner of this series will play the winner of the Ole Miss Virginia series game three tomorrow afternoon on ESPN and you talked about Brian O'Connor and the Virginia Cavaliers able to uh, get things done today against Ole Miss. And there is a tie between O'Connor and Paul Maneri. Oh yeah. I mean O'Connor the pitching coach for Paul Maneri at Notre Dame for nine years before he took the head job at Virginia. Talked to Paul Maneri before the game and he was just beaming. O'Connor's still a guy that I know he's very close with and if those two advance if LSU advances and Virginia advances they'd meet normal on game one. That'd be something. Uh -huh. 
Mike Bianco on the other side of that, the head coach at Ole Miss. I mean, really, you look at Bianco and Brian O'Connor, probably the two college coaches that you look at and say, one of them's due. I mean, one of them is due to take their team to Omaha. The good thing is one of them will get there this year. They've both been pretty close. First super for O'Connor, but Bianco's been there for the last five years at Ole Miss. And Arkansas is already on its way to Omaha. Dave Van Horn, what a great job he's done with the Razorbacks. After doing some wonderful things at Nebraska. Breaking pitch in to Micah Gibbs. One and one the count. Rogers on for Rice. This is Jared Rogers. We saw Jordan Rogers last night. Hit to left. Fairly deep. Fuda has it measured. And Rice gets out of the inning. Good job by Rogers out of the pen, but another run. On a home run by Helen Ehi, it's 5-2 LSU. The road to Omaha continuing on ESPN tomorrow from the NCAA Baseball Super Regionals. You're going to see North Carolina take on the Pirates of East Carolina. NCAA Baseball Super Regionals presented on ESPN by Capital One. That's tomorrow starting at noon Eastern. Mike Fox and the Tar Heels leading that series one game to none, and they really took it to East Carolina today. That's some of the power teams that we might get in Omaha. I mean, Texas the number one overall seed. They lead TCU early, although good to see TCU in that spot. This is their first super regional ever. Southern Miss, a great story. Florida won the top eight national seeds. We all know about Arizona State and Clemson. Carolina leads early. I mean, this is going to be a great College World Series. It starts next week. And a beautiful night here in Baton Rouge. This series to decide Who's going to Omaha between LSU and Rice? And right now, the Tigers in pretty good shape, leading 5 2. They've got one of their star pitchers, Lewis Coleman, on the mound. He's going to start to work here in the bottom of the sixth. And he'll face Jess Binger. Binger leads it off here. And he takes ball one. Lewis Coleman is a senior, 6'4, 190 pounds from Slaughter. Mississippi and he is very proud of his hometown chopper to first knocked down nicely by Ochenko he'll take it himself one out all right here's our Home Depot coaching clinic I'm talk safety squeeze right here and this is earlier in the ball game food of the batter and watch Diego Seastrunk at third base and he times this perfectly notice the, the, the break he didn't go right away. He's waiting to see where this ball goes down. Watch from this angle. He's working his way down the line. On a safety squeeze, you want to wait and make sure that that ball gets down and is past the pitch. Different than a suicide squeeze. Suicide squeeze, you're going to go on the first move of the pitcher. Seastruck timed it perfectly, made sure that that ball was down past the pitcher. Then he scored easily. And Seastruck is at the plate here. You know, what's interesting is there's not a lot of teams around the country that still run that. But the other one that you're going to see run it a lot is Augie Guerrero at Texas. I mean, between Wayne Graham and Augie Guerrero, a lot of wins, over 2,500 between the two of them. You're going to see those two run that safety squeeze, and they both run it really well. Is it any coincidence that they come from a different baseball era and they play that way? No, not at all. I mean, I, th I think that's one of the keys is it's, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't run it very often. I mean, if you ran a squeeze, it was a suicide squeeze. That's a great play, though, because... If you're the batter, you don't have to bunt it. Whereas on a suicide squeeze, you got to bunt at it because the guy's coming down the line. you got to protect your runner. But if you're a hitter, if it's not a strike, you can pull it back because your base runner's not coming down. It just, it's not as dire as a suicide squeeze. The guy to get the bunt down, he's out in a suicide squeeze. Safety squeeze gives you a little bit more flexibility. Three and one, not a seat strunk who tripled. And scored on that squeeze back in the fourth. Three and two now. Slaughter, Mississippi is located two hours south of Memphis, two hours north of Jackson, Mississippi. That's where Coleman is from. This one's fouled off. And he came in after we yeah. talked with him this week. 
About 10 minutes after he'd left the room, he came back in specifically to remind us that it's pronounced Slaughter, Mississippi. It's not spelled that way, but it is pronounced that way. What a great kid, too. And we got a chance to talk to a couple players from both of these teams. Coleman was one. He and Blake Dean and DJ LeMay, Hugh for LSU. And, and we love doing that every time. One, because obviously it allows us to learn a lot about him. But two, you, I mean, you see just how much these kids are enjoying this opportunity. Left field in the corner. This is going to be a tough play for Schimpf. And it sails out of here. Home run. It had enough carry for Diego Seastrom. A triple and now a home run for Diego tonight. And it's 5-3. Really like him as a player. And Wayne Graham just smiles when he talks about him and, and raves about the job that Seastrunk does when he comes up in big spots and what he does against really good arms. Obviously, Coleman's that guy. I like the way he's hit the ball tonight the other way too against Coleman a guy who's really going to run it away from the left hander he stayed on two balls triple the left center earlier game then this time hits a ball out to left field but you can tell that the approach has been to stay on that two seam fastball let's run it away from him try to drive the ball the other way and got a triple and a home run because of it. Now Coleman to face Fuda. When uh, we were talking with the LSU players that are hitters this week they said yeah the new Alec box is playing bigger we're not hitting as many home runs first guy to, today the first guy to step up and say oh no was Lewis Coleman and there you yeah. see that one carried out against Coleman well I think part of it too is the day and it, it's sometimes it's it's hard to explain I mean there's days where the ball just feels like it's flying better today's one of those days Skip Burtman said it earlier Paul Maneri said the same thing food have checked his swing did he go no Mitch Mealy, the first base umpire, waves it off. I think Fudo almost thought he went. You see that? He started to walk across on plate afterwards when they looked down at Mitch Mealy. I don't think he did. It looked like he held his hand. Hey, hey. That was a little closer than I thought. Watch him. See him start to walk? He thought he was out. <laughs> Pulled the shoot and went back and said, all right, we're ready to go. And he hangs in there. One and two. I love the look on his face. Yeah. It goes from thinking you're out to thinking, all right, now I've got a new life. Fuda first year as a starter. Second base to left field in the fall to better utilize his speed. And he hits this sharply to Helen He knocks it down and he's not going to have a play. Helen he has uh, looked good over there tonight. That was a tough play just to knock it down. And Fuda's aboard. There's not a lot you can do right here. I mean, a ball's rip, but the, the toughest hop is the one that kind of gets you on the lip. And this one's close. Watch this one hopper and right there. It's about a foot in front of the lip, and a lot of times it'll shoot that ball straight up like it did with Elanihi. You just got to guess at third base because it's hit so hard, and then hops kind of in that in-between hop area that you've, you've got to guess, but in Elanihi's side, you err on the side of keeping it in front of you. So at least in this case, he holds a base runner foot of the first. And a strike into Siltzbaugh. So Fuda over there at first base thought he had struck out. <laughs> now gets a single. Yeah, I mean, it changes the whole inning. And for Rice, I mean, they're only down two runs. Siltzbaugh in the air. Catcher Gibbs throws the mask away and gets the out. Big out for LSU here in the sixth inning. Big out and a nice job, too, of taking control of the whole field right there. Easiest play for Gibbs. You turn around right there. The ball's coming back in towards Fair territory and look at the job that Coleman's done so far 84 pitches now we're almost through six innings and nobody up and throwing in the bullpen they haven't even taken anybody down there yet so we want to talk about the confidence they have in Lewis Coleman the SEC pitcher of the year this year pitch count still fairly low and even though it's a 5-3 ball game there hasn't been one person run down at that pen yet talked about his demeanor uh, a hat off yes sir no sir yes ma'am kind of guy but we have seen him be very emotional tonight and the guys talk about what a fierce competitor Lewis Coleman is a couple of times when he's worked on a jams he has been emotional coming off the mound started in the first inning pitched himself out of a jam there and had a kind of a tiger fist pump heading off fouled away by Manuel you know and you'll see that a lot out of Barry too we just didn't see it tonight I mean he, he couldn't get himself into a 
kind of a good groove out there on the mound which usually Ryan Barry does and it's obviously disappointed thought we'd really see two guys on top of their game Barry was was trying to find it you could tell was just fighting to find something one pitch that he could really hang his hat on and just couldn't find a consistency tonight this one hit foul ground left side long run for Helen E and it's maybe a down foul again that's uh, that's the area where the accident happened earlier tonight second yeah. inning the star third baseman for Rice Anthony Rendon right there in front of the mound in the bullpen he was injured as he ran into his shortstop Rick Hague suffered an ankle injury came out of the game and he's likely done for the Super Regional. Pitchers high two and two. Crowd getting into it a little bit. More and more now as this game is getting later and later. LSU leading by two, but interesting to hear Skip Bertman say that this place isn't as loud as the old Alec Box. It's just not as quite as compact. I mean it's it's beautiful, but bigger, and so not quite as loud. Easy fly ball. Noah back on the grass makes the catch. Solo home run for Diego Seastrunk here at the bottom of the sixth as Rice back within two, but it's still a lead for LSU. The NBA Finals continue on ABC Sunday night. Game one, it was all Kobe and the LA Lakers against the Magic. Now it's Orlando's turn to answer. We'll see what happens in game two. Coverage begins with the GMC NBA countdown Sunday at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ABC. For more information, go to ESPN.com. Here's a look at old Alec Box Stadium, the uh, Intimidator, the national champions billboard that was so uh, intimidating, not in right field. Weeds growing up a little bit. Boy, 70 years that was the home of the Tigers. So many great memories made over there. Swung on off the bat of Matu. He's going to try for two. It's a leadoff double for Mikey Matu. LSU's got something going right away here in the top of the seventh. Matu not wasting any time here either. First pitch of the inning from Jared Rodgers with a break of ball that kind of hangs in the zone. And watch the swing of the freshman. Recognizes. Spin on this one. Hammers it on the left center field. And he's taking a double the minute he comes out of the box. When Paul Maneri talks about this freshman, he talks about how aggressive he plays the game, almost like he's a football player. This is a really talented LSU outfit. But Mikey Matuk overtook Leon Landry, who we saw last year and, and might have been as, as impressive as center fielder as maybe we saw defensively last year. Now the freshman is getting all the time. Now Mitchell shows bunt pulls the bat back takes strike. Now yeah, you're right Landry made two great catches in the Super Regional against Irvine. Both were uh, sports center plays of the day. But Mott took beat him out essentially. And you mentioned that he reminds you of a football player. Well he was asked to walk on by Les Miles and he has decided to concentrate on baseball. Got a chance to play baseball for a long time I think. Mitchell. And got an unlucky bounce off the edge of the turf. There. And a good decision right there by the catcher Manuel too with the speed of Mitchell who might be the fastest player in all of Division One baseball right now. There's no way you're going to throw him out if you bare hand this. Watch Manuel the catcher come out right here. I mean at this point when you see it kick off the grass you're going to take your chances and hope that it goes foul because the way that Mitchell gets out of the box and he's full speed already. There's no chance you're going to throw him out. So Rice. It's a gift right there. Now, now, now Mitchell in an 0-2 hole. We've seen Paul Maneri keep the bone on with two strikes. We'll see if he does it with Mitchell right here. Mitchell expected to be a first or second rounder later this month in the draft. Be surprised if he's not a first rounder. I mean, he's, he's so fast. And we talked about the plate discipline too, which I love. I mean, it's that's something a lot of teams are looking for right now. Two strikes to Mitchell. To short. Haig, he's going to go to third. Got him. Ma took. Going to be real aggressive there, and he's thrown out. A 
Real aggressive. I tell you what, at first look, I thought he was in there too. Tough hop for Haig to make this throw. Watch how this ball comes up on him. So Haig kind of has to jump right there, and you can see his momentum is all the way going backwards. I thought the right foot of Matsu got in there in time. Good job by Camarado to slap the tag down, but watch the foot. Does it get in there? Yeah, I don't know. See what he slid? His right foot kind of pops up right there. Yeah, he's still safe. He's still safe. He got under the tag, so that one could change it. I mean, for all of the momentum that feels like it's still on LSU's side, Rice is only down two runs. Yeah. I mean, those are big outs right now. That changes the inning for LSU. And now Rodgers to face Sean Ochenko as Mata goes to the water cooler. Ochenko tonight, one for three. First time facing Rodgers, and he shows butt. Runner goes. Here's the throw from Manuel. Not in time. Stolen base for Jared Mitchell. He had one last night. Now 35 on the year. And this one really goes to the pitcher, Rodgers. He can't let him get this kind of a walk and lead. Mitchell was off and running before Rodgers even started the home. Watch what Mitchell does on this lady. I mean, he's just the minute that Rodgers starts to go, he's at full speed already. I'll tell you what, pretty good throw by Manuel. That actually made it close. Manuel doesn't have a great arm. But he's really quick, and if this throws there, they actually have a chance. You just can't let a guy with the speed of Mitchell get a walk and lead right there because he's off and going with that kind of a jump. You're just not going to throw him out. Mitchell now with 69 career steals. He's second on LSU's all time list. Rob Hartwig had 73 stolen bases in the mid 80s. Inside Ochenko, it hit him. And he's going to be awarded first base. So first and second and one out for LSU. And Wayne Graham is not happy and he's going to walk out. Travis Wright is up in the Rice bullpen. And Graham just wants an explanation from the home plate umpire. I didn't see anything wrong there. I mean, I... It caught him on the backhand. Sometimes from the side, you can't tell if it hits the knob of the bat or if it hits the back arm. To me, it looked like it caught the back arm of Ochenko. Watch his hand start to go forward. It looks like it catches him right below the wrist. That's that top hand. Arm kind of comes down. Yeah, definitely didn't hit the bat. And you can't tell that it hit his arm right there, but you can see the way a shot from center field or the ball changed angle, so you know that it hit him. And Emmanuel can't catch it. You know that he's changing angles right when it gets close to him. The 6'6, 190 pound junior college transfer, Jared Rogers on the mound for Rice. And this one is chopped foul by Derek Helenihi. Good speed on the base paths here with Mitchell at second. Anything that gets through, and it's going to be another run for the Tigers. Big inning right now for Rice. I mean, you keep it at a two-run game, now you've really got a chance. I know that Coleman's been throwing the ball well, but still, I mean, you're a bloop and a blast away from timing this thing up, tying this thing up. But last thing you want is to get this crowd back into it. The LSU push a couple across, and it's really an uphill battle for Rice. Helenihi, his last time up, hit that solo home run in the sixth. It got out to right field. Two years ago, he transferred to LSU from a junior college in Fremont, California. He's made some nice contributions the last couple of seasons. Inside, runner going again, and did Mitchell get third? No. Thrown out by Craig Manuel. The second time Mitchell has been thrown out in this Super Regional. I don't know if I like taking a chance right there. Just you got guys on first and second up. Helen E's been swinging the bat pretty well, and I know that Mitchell has big time speed, but this is just a pretty good job by the freshman man to get back behind. What's tough for a catcher right here is you got to clear yourself from the hitter, but that's a perfect throw. A perfect throw. I mean, he doesn't have a can of it. Watch how quick he gets rid of it. Foot works great. Right foot's in the right spot, and he looks out from there. Camarada took the throw right on the bag, right where he needed to. And now one and two to Helen Ehe. It's the left arm. I think it's the only way he's going to get in there. And yeah, I think he was out. I think he got him on the elbow just before the left arm got in. It was close. I think he just got him. 
See Strunk started behind the plate last night for Rice. Manual tonight. Back up the middle. The shortstop. Haig gets over there. The flip to second. And that does it for LSU. They threaten but do not score against Rodgers. Rice within two. Ryan Burr, Will Kimmy in studio. And Cal State Fullerton having their way with Louisville. The long ball, the stolen base, a little bit of everything today, Will. Yeah, Jared Clark just destroys this baseball, and Fullerton is destroying Louisville the last two days. The Cardinals have nothing for the Titan offense. And Fullerton will move on to Omaha, where they will be one of the favorites. Game one, Southern Miss and Florida. We have an upset here. Yeah, the Corky Palmer going away to her continues. Southern Miss, the three seed, doesn't realize they're not supposed to be winning. And Southern Miss takes game one, 9-7. Could Southern Miss be the Fresno yeah. State of 2009? I don't know. It's Cinderella story in Omaha. It's always good. Here's our Coke Zero game track. And the unfortunate news for Rice, Anthony Rendon suffering a, a game, pro probably season-ending injury in the second inning. Didn't look good. His leg still elevated over there in that Rice dugout. But Colt has really been the offense for Rice. He hit a home run. Seastruck hit a home run earlier. We're going to see Brock Holt hit here in the seventh for Rice. He's due up second. Jimmy Camarata up there now. Rice has its work cut out. They are down two as this game is getting late. Lewis Coleman jamming Camarata there. It's foul. 0 oh 2. Here's a look at the injury to Rendon. Right there in the Rice bullpen. See out of nowhere the shortstop Rick Hegg comes in. He's looking at the ball. Rendon's looking at the ball. Nobody's really looking at each other. And like his left foot came down on Rendon's right ankle. Wow. Fourth strikeout for Lewis Coleman. This is where he's almost unhittable. If it's right on right and that ball starts on the inside corner and just dives down like it did right there for Coleman, there's just not a lot you can do with the play. Watch Camarada. And watch where this ball goes. It starts on the inside. See that sink? That's what separates Coleman. When the ball's sinking, instead of running, he's really good. And the difference is what he does with his hand. It's one of the things that they've been working on all year, and that was done real well. And now Brock Holt, who is three for three tonight, including a home run, hits with one out. Ball under strike. Coleman's dad, Hal, and mom, Kathy, come to a lot of the games for Mississippi. Wow, look at that pitch. Completely baffled Coleman. As you see, Lewis's line. Dad is a rice and soybean farmer. And he is real proud of his southern and country roots. What a play by the second baseman, LeMayhew. Boy, did that 6-4 frame come in handy. We've seen this two nights in a row from LeMayhew. Last night and tonight, he timed it perfectly. Watch this. At the very top of his jump, LeMayhew goes all the way up to get it. Remember, he's been playing second base now for about three weeks. So a kid that's still learning the position in a perfect spot, playing about two feet onto the outfield grass, takes away what could have been extra bases for Rice. You don't see a lot of 6 4 second basemen in college no. baseball. You don't see a lot of them in pro ball. No. Seems to be working out here in Baton Rouge. What a breaking pitch from Lewis Coleman. Coleman on the year, 123 strikeouts. Just 19 walks all season. He has no walks allowed tonight. Two balls and a strike to Rick Haig. Look how quick he works, too. And infielders love when a guy works quick. I mean, he gets the ball, he gets back on the rubber, he's ready to go. He's waiting on the hitter every time. He already has in his mind, when he gets the ball back from the catcher, what he's going to do next. Well, that one's in the dirt. Slipped out of his hand a bit. And it is a warm night. Yeah. A little muggy. Still, though, for this time of year down here, I mean, we've had pretty, two pretty comfortable days. I mean, yesterday was perfect. Last night was perfect. Tonight's a nice night. Yeah, it was warm when we were down on the field. 
but it was hot when we were here last year. Good crowd again. Set a record last night over 9,300. And Coleman comes back to fill out the count. It's three and two now to Rick Haig. Crowd comes alive for Coleman. Got him. Strikeout number five for Lewis Coleman. And there's a little bit of that emotion. He's starting to feel it. LSU leads by two. We head to the eighth. ESPN's coverage of the NCAA Baseball Super Regionals presented on ESPN by Capital One. Great tailgating here at Baton Rouge. 5-3 LSU leads. And the College World Series returns to Omaha. The action beginning a week from today, June 13th, 2 o'clock Eastern, live on ESPN HD. For more information on the College World Series, go to NCAA.com, the official online home for all 88 NCAA championships. Austin Nola leads off for the Tigers, who lead at 5-3 here in the eighth inning. Alongside Kyle Peterson, I'm Clay Matvick. And Kyle, LSU, when leading after the sixth inning this year, is 47-0. and And here we are in the eighth. Doesn't bode well for the Owls. No, no and it looks like Lewis Coleman's getting stronger. I mean, that last inning might have been his most impressive inning so far of the night for LSU. Jared Rogers on the mound for the Owls, the second pitcher to work tonight. Ryan Berry pitched five and then was taken out of the game. Ball and two strikes to the LSU number nine hitter. LSU 50 and 16 coming into tonight. 50 wins for the first time since 2007. They won 52 that year. Or since the year 2000, I should say, as Nola strikes out for out number one. Sports Center right now. Let's go to Ryan Burr. All right, 141st running to the Belmont Stakes. Mind That Bird was the favorite. It's a different bird, Summer Bird, that wins. Mind That Bird gets the show over $28. To the winner. Finals of the French Open on the women's side. Savetlana Kuznosova won the French Open title today, taking care of business 6 4 6 2, her second Grand Slam title. Summer Bird, is that who you thought was going to win it? I kind of want, I wanted to see Burrell win all three. Yeah. Run two of them on different horses. He's a Louisiana guy, too, isn't he? He rode at a track down here in Louisiana. That's kind of where he made that. his name. Roller to short. Haig has it. And LeMayhew is retired. Round number two. You know, Rogers has been real good since coming on. And I mean, I could see why Wayne Graham took Barry out. One, he wasn't very consistent on the mound. But two, you give up a home run and hit the next guy. And you could see emotion start to get into it for Barry. But Rogers comes on and really pitches his way out of the sixth inning, throws a, a scoreless seventh, and now has been real good here getting the first two guys out in the eighth. He's kept Rice close enough to they have still got a chance in this one. Now Ryan Schimpf to hit. Lays off that one. One ball and no strikes. Schimpf hasn't been on yet tonight. A couple of walks, or he has been on a couple of walks, but no hits. Score to run. It was his big blow last night that turned things in LSU's favor in game one. Three run home run in the fifth inning. It was part of a, a six run inning for LSU. Took the lead, never relinquished it. And really, it's been the Tigers since that point in the Super Region. Yeah. Yeah. And it was Rice in total control. I mean, they were just floating along through the first four innings of the game yesterday. And LSU was kind of handed it to them. Made three errors, and Rice was taking advantage of it. And with one swing, once Schimpf took that swing, from that point forward, it's been all LSU. He's got a two on count as he steps out of the box. Ryan Schimpf is uh, draft eligible. Here it is from last night. Impressive, too, that it's off a left-hander. That's what Schimpf had struggled with a little bit this year. 
And he's got a base hit here. Two odd single, and LSU has a man on in the eighth. And Schimpf, like I said, he is eligible for the draft here in a week or so. And Paul Maneri says, you know, I'm going to cry if I lose him because uh, I'd love to have him stick around. Could be in that I mean, sixth, seventh, eighth round. He could maybe go a little bit earlier than that. And, and that's the tough spot for a college juniors and enough money to buy you out of coming back and playing your senior year. Now Blake Dean, who seems to have uh, really found his groove. And he's been in it for a while, but it has continued here in the postseason. Paul Maneri said once uh, Blake stopped trying to hit home runs, he started hitting home runs. And on the hands, a little jam shot to the shortstop, Rick Hague. And that does it. So LSU gets a man on Stransom here in the top of the eighth. 5 3 Tigers get late for Rice. The NCAA Super Regionals is presented on ESPN by Capital One. What's in your wallet? There is the uh, living, breathing mascot of the LSU Tigers, Mike the Tiger. Mike number six as it is and he has got some nice digs here on the campus of LSU in fact uh, that little playground for him was remodeled about two years ago big swimming pool for him over there it's not that far from Tigers Stadium the football home of LSU and I'm surprised that with all the uh, new digs over here at new Alec Box Stadium that they didn't make a little play pen for him over here during little, games little second home yeah the seat out behind right field. We got to go over and see that. It's a nice cap. That's a great setting here too. I mean, you get the in that football stadium in center field. So much history there, obviously, but just a mammoth. Three, four, and five to hit for Rice in the eighth. And Chad Mazingo takes ball one from Lewis Coleman, who has been brilliant here tonight. He has scattered eight hits. Three runs from Rice. And seven really good innings from the right hander. Well, a couple swings have hurt him. I mean, two home runs and a triple. It looks like Matty Ott. No, that's Bertasini that's now up and throwing. We saw him last night. Bertasini, a guy that can throw just about every night. Matty Ott, the freshman closer, not up and throwing yet. I would think if you're Paul Maneri, you'd like to see Coleman finish this one if he can. I mean, he's, he's been that good up to this point. Looked really strong last inning. Missed off the inside corner. Three and one now. To Mazingo as the pitch total is up over 100. 106 for Lewis Coleman. Look how many strikes he's thrown though. I mean, two to one strikes to balls at this point. That's a I mean that's a great number. If you're throwing 65, 66 percent strikes, that's that's exactly where you want it. You get beyond that, obviously it's even better, but he's really filled up the zone so far tonight. There's a base hit to center leading off the inning for Mazingo. Hit number nine for Rice. LSU got a great performance from their starter last night, Anthony Renato. Went seven and two thirds. Struck out nine. He picked up his tenth win, and we're seeing yeah. equally as good stuff from Coleman today. Look at that walk column. None yeah. between the two of them. And that was the biggest difference last night. It was a big difference tonight. Rice walked six guys last night. They hit three. So nine free base runners last night for LSU. Tonight, Barry walks four, and he just changed the whole game. He was good. And he pitched without his best stuff. Well, not a really battle last night. And a strike to Binger. And the crowd will help any pitcher. You get 9,400 people or more than that behind you, it, it's got to be an advantage. Now think, though, about the injury to Rendon, because this is his spot. And we've got Binger coming up, who's a senior and obviously can do some things, but Rendon would be coming up with one swing and could tie it. 
fouls this one off. He's behind in the count, two strikes to Coleman. And they're still in a decent spot. I mean, you get bigger now, you've got Seastrunk coming after him who's already hit a home run. But obviously, you take a guy like Rendon out of the middle of this lineup who's hitting fourth. And now, potentially would have come up with a spot to, to tie it here in the eighth inning. Got to be tough. I mean, I know he's been smiling a lot of the game, but I don't care how good of a disposition you have. You know it's tough to sit there and watch. It's been an up and down career for Binger. In 2007, he was a regular in the Rice lineup. Last year, a foot injury kept him out of the lineup for quite a bit of the time. And this year, with the emergence of the other guys, he hasn't played a lot. Hit well to right field. And on the warning track, running it down is Mitchell. But that was uh, pulled pretty solidly by Binger. But it's out number one. Thought he got it when it came off the bat. You could see immediately the route that Mitchell took that it didn't have quite enough. But the sound of it and the way that the ball came off the bat and really the way that the ball's been carrying to right field looked like this ball had a chance to carry out, but it had just a little bit of top spin. Binger got extended. See Mitchell with a good break. He's going to catch it just in front of the track. But now the pitch count for Coleman starting to inch up there. Now over 110. That is 111th pitch right there to Binger. Diego Seastrunk swinging a good bat tonight, a triple and a home run. Seastrunk earlier tonight was warming up in the Rice bullpen. I want to see him. I mean, Wayne Graham talked about him on the mound. I mean, he can run it up 93, 94 miles an hour. I'm surprised that we haven't seen him yet. Didn't pitch that many innings this year. I think about five innings on the season, but he can really run it up there. We talked about C strength from a professional standpoint. They moved him behind the plate tonight, or excuse me, during the course of the year, primarily because of Rendon. He's DH tonight. The freshman manual is caught. And Wayne Grant thought I gave him the best chance to play pro ball, maybe separate himself behind the plate as a big time arm. And he threw a guy out last night on a ball that he blocked. It was just a seed out to second base. Two and one now to Seastrunk as LSU has quite a bit of activity in its bullpen. A righty and a lefty warming up. The left hander is Jones. He has joined Bertasini, and I know you really want to see him pitch yeah. too. He's a great story on the mound. Fouled straight back. Two and two. Here is Diego Seastrunk in the sixth inning. And didn't think that this was going to get out of here at first, but it just kept going. Well, look at the approach, too. I mean, you can tell he's trying to go the other way. That ball had great backspin to left center field. He had tripled to left center earlier. This one a little bit closer to down the line. And now the Tiger faithful coming to their feet here, trying to give Coleman just a little bit of a jump start here in the eighth. Tried to do the same thing going the other way. I think that's the approach. I mean, when a guy throws across his body like Coleman does, the toughest pitch to make is that fastball inside to a left hander because all of your momentum's going kind of towards the third base side of home plate. So you got to reach all the way across your body to get that ball there. He's made it at times, but he's most inconsistent on that side of the plate. Runner goes to second, taking the double play out of order as. Mazingo was in motion, two outs. NCAA championship update. Now let's go to Ryan Burr. All right, joined by Will Kimmy, Texas and TCU. Barn burner right now. TCU down two, but not for long, Will. Yeah, senior Matt Vern with a home run, 16 for him. Matt Carpenter, another senior hit one. That's the third home run of the day for the Horn Frogs. And Texas in business now, bottom of the sixth inning. They lead it 5 4. Longhorns take the lead. All right, Ryan and Will, thank you very much. We take a look at that side of the bracket. Uh, Texas and TCU. And Southern Miss leading that series with Florida one game to none. And North Carolina put a spanking on East Carolina in game one of that series. Alex White struck out 12 in that game. North Carolina had 17 hits in game one. It looks like Mike Fox's team back to it's old tricks. They are loaded. Lewis Coleman, seven and two thirds, getting a visit 
on the mound, and it, it looks like he's going to stay in there. Yeah. I think that was probably more of a scouting report trip than anything else. David Grew out to talk to him, the pitching coach for LSU, and I think they're going to bring him out here. But with a left-hander and a right-hander available down in the bullpen, if they take Coleman out, they'll probably play matchups. Try to get through this inning and then bring out into the ninth. But I think at this point, it's it's Coleman's game unless Rice can push one across. Two outs for Michael Fuda. Swings and hits it to right field. Should be an easy play for Jared Mitchell. And after the visit, Coleman. One pitch, one out. LSU continues to lead 5-3. Brian Burr, Will Kimmy updating Texas and TCU. Horn Frogs tied it on a two run home run. Texas comes right back, Will. Connor Rowe, great athlete. Really reminds me of former Texas star Drew Stubbs in the outfield and here at the plate coming through in the clutch. And Texas now 5 4, bottom of the sixth inning. Coming up to the top of the hour, expecting to see United States versus Honduras in the FIFA World Cup qualifier. The start of our coverage will be moved to ESPN Classic. Uh, the game is uh, supposed to start about 8.25, so as soon as we're done here, it will be moved to ESPN. For now, it's heading to Classic. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. LSU leading 5-3 as this one moves to the ninth. Game two of the Baton Rouge Super Regional. Winner of this series goes on to Omaha. LSU taking game one last night, 12-9. And the Tigers looking for insurance here in the ninth. Micah Gibbs, Mikey Matuk, and Jared Mitchell, the scheduled hitters against Jared Rogers. Rogers came on in relief in the sixth inning. He gets a fly ball left side. And it's going to be caught by Haig for out number one. A Pontiac game changing performance. No doubt, Lewis Coleman, the right handed starter for LSU. What a night. The starting pitching that LSU's had the last two nights. Renata was so good last night, went seven and two thirds and dealt. Coleman more the same tonight. Pitched out of a couple jams, picks up a couple solo home runs. A triple to Diego Seastrunk, who scores on a, or a safety squeeze. But other than that, I mean, he has been really good tonight. Matty Coleman is the closer for LSU. In fact, set a new LSU single season record for saves this year with 15. And uh, do we see him in the ninth, or does I, Coleman come back out? I still don't think we do. I mean, I'd, I'd be out down there warming up right now, and you can see David Brewer right next to him, the pitching coach. They're, I mean, he's warming up like he's getting ready to come in. I still, where Coleman's pitch count is, I, I'd be surprised if they bring out in to start the inning. It might be a situation where if, if there's a base runner that comes on, then it's Ott's game. You bring Coleman back out, and if he goes through it, then you let him finish it. But I. The way that Ott's warming up right now, he's warming up like he's coming into the game. My took. Two balls and a strike as you take a look at Ott. Right next to David Gruy. Gruy left Michigan State. He was the head coach at Michigan State to become the pitching coach here. To center. Long run for Saltzbaugh, but he's got it. Two down. What does that say about a program when you, when you get a coach that leaves a head job to become a pitching coach? Well, and, and he and Paul Maneri had a history. They were together in Notre Dame for a while, and Gruy went and took the job at Michigan State. Michigan State was putting some money into their program as well, but it's it's just such a difference in baseball in these power conferences and, and the challenges that you have in the Big Ten with weather and travel and all the other things that you really don't have to worry about so much down here that David Gruy thought this was a better spot. Obviously, you step into one of the top programs in the country. Two outs for Jared Mitchell. Diego Seastrunk is loosening up for the second time tonight in the Rice Bowl. Pack. The bottom third of the order is due up for Rice in the bottom of the ninth. Last chance for the Owls. 5-3 LSU leads. A trip to Omaha on the line. LSU might be three outs away from going to the program's 15th College World Series and their second straight. Lewis Coleman, he's done for the night. 
eight innings of work, and he is in line for the win. Getting some hugs in the dugout. What a beautiful performance in game two of this Super Regional. They hand it off to Matty Ott, the right-handed closer, a freshman. 15 saves on the year, which set a new program record. And that record stood for 18 years. That'll be one of the biggest surprises on this LSU team. They thought that he'd pitch, but there's no way that they thought he'd fill the role that he has this year. 15 saves, a third team All American, a freshman All American all over the place. Pretty much a three pitch guy. He'll throw a two seam and a four seam fastball, a good slider, and a changeup. Paul Maneri said he's got more composure than any freshman I've ever had, and he throws a ton of strikes. First pitch to Saltzbar. Grounded to short. Nola. What a. Tigers are two outs from Omaha. Coleman right there on the top step, looking on intently. Strike to Craig Manuel. Manuel tonight, 0 for 3. Ott has 62 strikeouts on the year, just four walks. Deep to right, but Mitchell is there. One out from Omaha. Almost 10,000 Tiger fans have come to their feet. We've got a pinch hitter for Rice. Ryan Lewis is going to hit for Jimmy Camarata. Lewis was the designated hitter last night. Lewis went 0 for 2 in game one. And Ott misses inside. when he hit Ryan Lewis <laughs> so now the tying run comes to the plate and it's Brock Holt who has three hits tonight including a solo home run I'll give Lewis credit too. the freshman climbed right on the plate right there and that fastball that was inside there's no way he was getting out of the way on first base any way you can now it turns this rice line up over he gets to the powerful leadoff man Holt Holt a single in the first, a solo home run in the third, a single in the fifth, and he lined out to LeMahieu at second in the seventh. And here comes Paul Maneri. Brock Holt represents the tying run in this game. He had a home run yesterday. Here's a look. This one in the ninth, too. They got Rice back within three runs. Looked like they were out of it. This gave him a chance. Well, she would go on to win that game 12 9, and then today in the third inning. Solo shot to about the same spot. This one may be a little bit further over to right center field. And Graham has raved about his second baseman's power. He's put on a show the first two days here. There weren't a ton of great swings against Lewis Coleman. Brock Holt has He's three of them tonight. Yeah. Swung on, down the line, and just foul. Making a bid for extra bases. Outside of the bag at first. You see Ochenko playing no doubles over there at first base, not holding the base runner on and hugging that first base line. They're not going to let anything get past him in fair territory. If it gets by Ochenko, they're going to force it to be to the second base side. You want to make sure that if it does get through the infield with the outfitter Mitchell, they can get there in plenty of time. 
They'll give that base runner second base to not allow a double. Swung on and ripped again into the corner, but foul. Brock Holt is timing Matty Ott pretty well. We've seen, too, the approach for Holt is everything he's hit hard has been to the right side. And the two strikes, that'll get everybody on their feet here. Get a piece of it to stay alive. Good slider. Good slider for the freshman. We've seen him throw a lot of strikes. He hit, obviously, the nine hole hitter Lewis. Put him on first base, but other than that, he's thrown a ton of strikes, and this time shows a tight little slider. I think he was trying to wrap it around Holt's back foot. Just missed. This Alec Box crowd wanted it. The miss is off the plate. Change up, and I think they're trying to get swing and a miss from Holt right here, and a nice job of taking a look at Coleman. <laughs> and Tiger Bench just waiting to erupt. Nice hit and done yet, though. This kid can change things with one swing. Got him! Look out, Omaha. Here come the Tigers again. For the 15th time in program history, LSU is going to the College World Series. And here's our player of the game brought to you by Capital One, Lewis Coleman. Eight outstanding innings. SEC Pitcher of the Year, and you see why today. Coleman comes up in a big spot. The starting pitcher for LSU so good in the entire weekend. Ronaldo gets the win yesterday and goes seven to two thirds. Lewis Coleman gets it today, goes eight complete, and now he'll have a chance to pitch in Omaha again. So we can update the bracket LSU moving on. They will be in the Big O a week from today when the College World Series starts on June 13th. They will await the winner of the Virginia Mississippi Series now. And game three coming up Sunday 3 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. A happy pulmonary and a happy crowd here in Baton Rouge as Louisiana State is going back to Omaha 5-3 the final as they take care of Rice in two games in this Super Regional. It's been fun, Kyle. Always, Always is when we blast, come to buddy. Baton Rouge. So for Kyle Peterson and our entire ESPN crew, I'm Clay Matvick. We send you to our NCAA studio with Ryan Burr. For more information, log on to ESPN.com. So long from Baton Rouge.